All right, well, since the live stream is on, are we recording yet? Let's see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Got the notes. You're good to go. Wonderful, and there's Sarah. Wonderful. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's 4.01 p.m. I'm gonna go ahead and call to order a regular meeting of the Grand County Municipal Building Authority. Um, those present are um, members of the Grand County Commission, Kevin Walker, Trisha Dean, Sarah Stock, Evan Clapper, and Jacques Hadler, and um, myself, Chair Gabriel Wojtek. Uh, Mary McGann is currently not present. Uh, Strategic Development Director Chris Baird is also present in addition to members of the public. Um, I'll leave the introductions at that. Um, so calling to order, uh, first, first item on the agenda is approval of minutes. I would, I would entertain a motion to approve minutes for January 18th, 2022. I'll, I'll move to approve the minutes for January 18th, 2022. Got a second? I'll second it. All right, motion by Commissioner Walker, second by Commissioner Hedin. Any discussion with regards to the minutes? Seeing none, I will call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Passes unanimously. Uh, no, pre no presentations or discussion items on the agenda, so we'll run right into action. Um, and that'll be item B, uh, ratifying President Wojtek's signature on an application to the CIB Community Impact Board for funds for the Jackson Street Storm Drain Phase Two project in the amount of one million three hundred and fifty-six thousand um, dollars. And I'll just le leave it to Bill and Chris to present on this. Thank you, Gabe. So we had our public hearing for this project um, a couple weeks ago. We did receive one public comment um, expressing some concern about the possibility of the uh, culvert interfering with existing utilities. And so Bill Jackson reached out to this uh, individual and, and I believe discussed those topics. Um, the engineering will certainly take into account existing utilities when we um, design the elevations for the culvert. Um, but that's the only public comment that we received. Um, the CIB does require that we have signed minutes of the public hearing, so that's a, lar a large part of the reason for calling this, this meeting is to make sure that we have the signed minutes and then also to just might as well go ahead and ratify uh, Gabe's signature on the full application, which is in your packet. Just to go over the project again one more time really quick, this is a uh, um, phase two of the Jackson Street uh, stormwater mitigation project. The first phase was the uh, detention basin, and the second phase is the uh, culvert that runs from the overflow of that detention basin to Pack Creek, and it's uh, essentially a, a buried culvert. Um, it's going to, you know, a big part of the expense is going to be shooting it under the highway. Um, but anyway, the total. The uh, estimated cost of the project is $2,711,943. Uh, Grand County is proposing to put up $1,090,943. Uh, the Transportation Special Service District is uh, looking to put up $265,000 for the project. And then we're requesting a uh, grant of $1,356,000 to shore up <clears throat> the total. Um, High likelihood and we won't get all of that in grant and we'll likely uh, receive some type of loan offer. The reason why we're um, passing this through the Municipal Building Authority is so that we can structure the loan as a lease revenue bond, which requires the Municipal Building Authority to do. So uh, that's it, unless anybody else has any questions. Um, all we're looking for is a motion to ratify this uh, chair's signature on the application. Questions or a motion? I'll make a motion. I move to ratify the chair's signature on the CIB application for a $1,356,000 grant 
for Jackson Street Stormwater Conveyance System Phase Two project. Thanks, Kevin. Do I have a second? Thanks, Sarah. Any further discussion on this item? All right, well, so we had a motion by Commissioner Walker, a second by Commissioner Stock. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Vote passes unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris and Bill, for your very hard work on getting this together. No, it's not easy. Um, so wishing us luck on, on it moving forward. Um, no other public hearings, considerations, or closed sessions on this agenda. So I'll go right ahead and adjourn the this Grand County Municipal Building Authority regular meeting at 4.06 p.m. And we'll move right on to the Grand County Commission regular meeting, calling to order at 4.06. Um, those present are the same that were in our Municipal Building Authority meeting. Um, I'll also just take a quick moment to also introduce Andrew Solzvig, Airport Director. Let's see, we have Planning and Zoning Director John Gunther, Clerk Auditor Quinn Hall. Um, in addition to six members of the Commission, um, Commissioner McGann, presently absent, as well as uh, Commission Administrator Mallory Nassau. Happy birthday, Mallory. So, first, um, now that the meeting is called to order, I'll go ahead and open up citizens to be heard. Um, if you are here to make public comment, which you are most welcome to do, we have this section as well as uh, 6 p.m. citizens to be heard. And we ask that you just choose one of those sections to make comment on. Um, so yeah, if you are here to make comment, uh, Raise your hand and introduce yourself by name and please limit your comments to two minutes. Hey, Gabe, could I um, just say something very briefly? Because I, I think a lot of people are here to comment on the Title V revisions. And I just wanted to say one, I, I think it's unlikely that we're going to pass these, um, this meeting. Um, the consensus seems to be, you know, it needs some additional work and we very much look forward to hearing people's comments on the the current draft, but I just don't want people to get worried that it's about to become law. I, I think that's unlikely. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and, and I think there'll be a, but we will discuss it, I, I hope, when the agenda item comes up and you know what tweaks we might want to make, so. Thanks so much, Kevin. So uh, Title V revisions um, likely will only be discussion tonight. Um, of course, anyone is still willing to or um, is still welcome to comment um, if they wish. Um, not sure how to create a queue here, um, but I would say speak up if you'd like to um, make comments at this moment. So yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing anybody raise their hand um, or you, know, you can send me a chat. Or you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself if you are a citizen to be heard. Yeah, Mr. Carpenter. Hi, yeah, my name is Graham Carpenter. I am the rental manager at Barlow Adventures in Moab, Utah here. and. Uh, just uh, and Mr. Walker, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, looks like you guys are not going to be doing anything permanent this evening on the Title V issue. I personally just became aware of it uh, today. The proposed changes, obviously, that will have some effect on our business operations as we are a Jeep rental. Um, and I did get a chance to read through the proposal today. And uh, my main question, uh, just and it, if there's going to be further time to discuss, fantastic. But there's definitely particulars that I think need, uh, need to be addressed. But um, my main question, and if there's a resource that I could be pointed towards um, that would be helpful, uh, would be understanding, you know, why, why is the commission proposing these changes? You know, what is the overarching goal that you guys are, are seeking to reach? I think that would be really helpful for, or for me personally and our company to understand, you know, what, what are we trying to do here? So if there is uh, a resource or a statement that uh, would be helpful for that, I would really appreciate it. And uh, that's that's really all I have at this point. Thanks so much for your comment. And hopefully we can address those concerns. 
Is there anyone else uh, here for citizens to be heard? Please go ahead and unmute yourself or press star six if you're on calling in. All right. So we'll be having another citizens to be heard at 6 p.m. And we welcome citizens to call in at that point as well to make uh, public comment. Moving on, uh, we don't have any department reports scheduled for this evening, um, but what we do have next is an agency report, and that's item A, and that's the report from the Historical Preservation Commission regarding the Ind Indigenous Peoples Land Acknowledgement Statement. Uh, Jody Patterson, who's the Historical Preservation Commission Chair. Um, hi, Jody. I'll invite you to present and report. Great. I appreciate it. Uh, John Gunther had, had suggested we give you guys an update on what we've been discussing over the past uh, few meetings at the Histor Historic Preservation Commission. And what's come up is a uh, developing an indigenous lands and territorial acknowledgement statement for the county. These have become a useful tool for a lot of organizations um, throughout Utah and throughout the US and Canada over into Australia even, just to recognize uh, indigenous populations that were here, that they're still here, in that uh, you know, we we acknowledge that we as a society today need to commemorate that aspect of our heritage of everybody's heritage together in general um got some notes here uh, basically an acknowledgement statement is simply something that recognizes that indigenous peoples who have been disposed from their homelands and territories upon which an institution was built and currently operates such as grand county in practice the acknowledgement statement recognizes that indigenous peoples inhabited and continue to inhabit places and areas and regions that have been significantly and irreparably altered physically, social, uh, physically, socially, and economically, often to the detriment of indigenous peoples. And that acknowledging and honoring native peoples, uh, both past and present, must, must be more than just a simple statement and, and an acknowledgement, but a starting point for further communications, reconciliations, collaborations, and understandings of our shared human heritages. Um, one question that came up is why really does Grand County uh, possibly need an acknowledgement statement? And if we just look at the history of this area, for the last 12,000 years, indigenous peoples made up 100% of the population of what is now Grand County. A few hundred years ago, that changed and it changed significantly and it changed quickly. Today, the Native American population in Grand County is right around 5% based on the uh, 2020 census data that's available so far. It's significantly higher than the state average, which is just under 2%, uh, but still significantly lower than some of the neighboring counties, such as Uinta County, which has about 12% Native American population, and of course, San Juan, which is a majority uh, Native American population at 51%. Archaeological evidence shows that, you know, this area has been inhabited for at least 12,000 years by different Native Americans, starting with Paleo Indians in the past, moving on to these archaic hunter and gatherers that were around for five, 6,000 years. Then we get into more recent times where we have what we call formative cultures, which are the ancestral Puebloans and the Fremont peoples, which were basically farmers. Um, and then most recently, and still today, in considerable numbers, we have the modern tribes that are present, most namely the Ute, the Navajo, the Paiute. And we still have, uh, there are still ancestral ties from some of the Pueblos, particularly Zuni and Hopi. Um, not all interactions in the past once American settlers and Europeans started coming in were necessarily negative, but there were some serious uh, skirmishes and other, let's say, actions that pretty much 
disposed and displaced a lot of the Native Americans here in the country and in the, in the county, I'm sorry. Um, and part of the acknowledgement is that we own those historical events, but we go on to move on and try to in, in improve relationships with uh, the sovereign tribal nations that are surrounding the county and in the county. Um, our process for starting to address this is looking at taking more than just writing a simple acknowledgement. What we want to do is to engage with uh, the sovereign nations, particularly the Ute, the Navajo, the Zuni, the Hopi, and the Paiute from the beginning of this and not develop this acknowledgement statement outside of them, but with them. Um, we hope to also uh, uh, but, but collaborate with some of the, the groups here in Grand County, particularly the Full Circle Intertribal Center and the Moab Valley Multicultural Center to get input and ideas um, as well as other uh, collaborations with um, planning with uh, the Travel Council, some of the some of the local government groups too that have these interactions with indigenous populations as well. And I think in your packets you did get a, a draft white paper that explains a lot of this stuff, but we're expanding that significantly to include a, a deeper and broader cultural context and historical context for uh, the indigenous populations and the relationships with modern, with the modern government here in Grant County. Um, and then we're planning on hoping to have workshops and deal with, with uh, the public and these other organizations and to hopefully have something put together, draft form for the commission to look at by the end of this year. Um, in a nutshell, that's all, all I wanted to say. We're just working through this now, but wanted to make sure that the, the commission was aware of what we're doing and take any comments, concerns, criticisms, ideas that you guys have to, to move forward in this as well. Thanks, Jody. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, for Mr. Patterson at this time? No real question, but just uh, an appreciation for the depth that, that you and the crew are, are taking this. So um, I think, thanks for that. Yeah, I agree. This is a valuable action and good to see that it's gonna be a nice long, well thought out, well thought out process as well. Um, and, uh, I, um, I had one comment. I really appreciate the effort also. Um, it's really nice to have obviously to have something like this for the, in the future the, so the county can use it and others can use it. Um, but I was kind of confused by just some of the verbiage in um, the sentence where it says like, while only one reservation is present in Grand County and another four federally and state recognized tribes reside nearby, Grand County represents part of each tribe's traditional territory and homeland. And I, I guess now that I'm reading it, I think that refers back to the nine tribes of Utah, but it was sort of confusing to me whether it was like those five tribes and if it was, then maybe it could be specific or. Yeah, we can we can definitely clean, clean up that language. Basically what it's, it's trying to get at is right now the federally recognized tribes and their reservations don't necessarily fall with, with the exception of the Uinta Array Reservation don't fall in Grand County at all. But there, the ethno-historic territories and home ranges were very fluid. And a lot of these groups interacted, traded, intermarried, and kind of shuffled all over the landscape. And that was just trying to get at that. Yeah, while we don't have the reservations per se in Grand County, this was still an area that was heavily used and, and lived in by lots of different groups of people through time. Thanks. Yeah, I was just a little confused who it was referring to, but that makes sense if it's um, broadly like all of the tribes. 
Yeah, and and for for the most part, what it's really in the recent history, it would be referring to the Uinta UA root Utes, the Ute Mountain Utes, the Navajo, and Paiute are the the main historic groups that were here when white settlers arrived. But yeah, and that is just a draft. It was very just. It was a rough draft for us to just get some stuff down on paper so we knew where we were going and kind of help us design out a plan for trying to get this done in the year. So that'll be changing a lot. Thank you, I think it's really great. Well, Jody, you had mentioned that there are, um, you know, roughly 5% of the current population that resides in Grand County um, is indigenous. Um, do you have a plan for engaging with those um, residents um, or consulting with them as part of this process? Um, what I'm hoping, and I haven't reached out to them yet, but I'm hoping that the full circle intertribal uh, organization here in town can help with that, since we don't have a direct line to a whole bunch of folks, but they might, and we might be able to engage with them through some of these partnerships that we hope to get going. Great. That sounds like a good plan to me. Any other questions or comments? Thanks so much, Jody, for presenting and we'll be in touch about this. Have a good awesome. evening. Thanks so much. Yep. And stay tuned for the rest of the meeting if you'd like. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, we'll go ahead and move on to approval of minutes, that's item B. And um, I would understand a motion to approve minutes for January 18th, 2022. Of, a re of the regular Graham County Commission meeting. So moved. Do I have a second? Second by Commissioner Walker. Do I, uh, any discussion or corrections to be made on these minutes? All right, we had a motion by Commissioner Clapper, second by Commissioner Walker, a call for a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Vote passes unanimously, thank you all. Moving on to ratification of payment of bills. Grand County bills the, to be approved for February 1st, 2022. Total bills in the amount of $671,653.35. Total payroll in the amount of $300,464.43. Total bills and payroll in the amount of $972,117.78. Um, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the bills as stated by the chair. I'll move to approve the county bills as stated by the chair. Thanks, Jacques. Do I have a second? I'll second that. All right. Any discussion? We had a motion no, on the floor by Commissioner Hadler. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I like how you're keeping your job going. Thanks for that. <laughs> practicing my auctioneer skills. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, we had a uh, motion on the floor by Commissioner Hadler, seconded by Commissioner Hedin. I'll call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Passes unanimously. Moving on, Commissioner Member Disclosures. Are there any disclosures that any member of the commission would like to make at this moment? Okay, not seeing any. And so we'll move on to general commission reports and future considerations. I'll start with uh, Commissioner Hedin. Oops, can you hear me, Gabe? Okay, great. So, sorry, I'm kind of, okay, there we go. Um, I went to, we were all a part of the Utah land use training and that was excellent. I thought he did a great job of using examples to really solidify his thoughts. Um, I went to the Recreation Special Service District meeting on the 19th and monies were approved for some backstops out at um, the ball fields at OSTA. Let's see, there was a little bit of concern. There was some it, kind of dialogue regarding the pickleball courts and this idea that if 
Grand County were to be a part of that, that it would be nice to see them at OSTA. I know the city is also considering pickleball courts. So I don't know where that discussion is or that collaboration is, but I want you to know that that was a part of the dialogue. I did go to the Historical Preservation Committee meeting on the 20th. Um, we reinstated Jody Patterson, Don Montoya, and Josh Green, or voted to put those members back on the commission, and that'll be on our agenda tonight. And again, as um, Jody already mentioned, we talked quite a bit about the land acknowledgement and territory paper discussion and working through a rough draft. I did go to a planning commission meeting on the 24th. It was a really interesting meeting. Um, first of all, I want to state that we have like the all-star team. It's like the dream team. It's like, you know, Larry Bird and, and Michael Jordan, as far as a planning commission, um, just really spectacular members and really working hard on coming up with ideas about workforce housing, deed restrictions, extensions on evictions, that all of those things were brought up and discussed. So kind of going well beyond our agenda and really delving deeper into what can we do about the issues that are at hand. Um, Josh, talk, Josh came, which was awesome, and gave us an update on Title V. Um, lastly, there was a public hearing on the rezone at 2890 Spanish Valley Drive, and that will be coming in front of us, so I'm not going to go into that too much. Um, we did eventually write a letter to the county commission. The hope is to extend the cap on HDHOs and again, hoping, hoping to satisfy some of those issues with affordable housing. And then lastly, we did have a joint meeting with um, the city. And so that was great. It was really interesting just to kind of get together with them and, and go over, you know, common issues. We talked about things like dark skies, infrastructure, housing, transportation. Um, so quite a bit, a storm water, et cetera, and so on. And then lastly, I had a meeting. I want to say it was just, I can't remember now, last Thursday about the Bookcliffs Highway, just so you guys have a quick update. The Seven County Infrastructure Coalition did vote to push that application through. So the application and Mary just sent out a text recently. The application has been submitted to our regional BLM office. So they are off and running. Um, I will state that the general and Sarah can add to this on her on her um, just disclosures, but I think that they have kind of they, they appear to just be flip-flopping back and forth as to what the agenda of that highway is. And I think it relates to a lot of things, whomever their audience might be or who they, who they need on their team. But they were touting it as a tourism corridor. In that meeting, they made it very clear that it was a fossil fuels extraction highway, that they were hoping to pull stuff back out of the tar sands mine. And out of that tar sands also be able to pull like rare earth minerals. So that was really interesting and in that there, there were loadouts on the I-70 side that could be utilized. And so that was a little discouraging to say the least, but they are off and running. So that's it for me, Gabe. Thanks so much. Interesting to hear about those planning commission meetings to look back and I like the dream team uh, analogy there. <laughs> I'm wondering, I'm trying to figure out who is Magic Johnson, who is Larry Bird. Um, I like that reference. Uh, let's see, Commissioner Hadler, report. Well, is Michael Jordan for sure. <laughs> Thanks, Gabe. Um, I also attended the land use uh, code training and thought it was great. Learned a lot in that. Um, the same day, I attended a Museum of Moab meeting. Um, museum meetings are always great. Great board there as well. And we talked about uh, future board recruitment. And also uh, we worked on our step certification program to keep um, advancing the uh, certification and the cause of the museum forward. Um, the day after that, I attended the uh, historical preservation uh, committee meeting with Trish. And I think she covered that meeting very accurately. Um, 
Uh, I had a sustainable trails meeting, which Kevin also attended after that, our first one of the year, where we talked about the ambassador program um, messaging. And we also talked about uh, some of the movies that the Travel Council has produced um, that speak towards uh, recreating responsibly and um, keeping our, our tourism sustainable. Uh, those are some movies that will air on Channel 6 and some of the county outlets. Um, I attended a Chamber of Commerce meeting after that, uh, where we talked about the Arches Reservation System and ways that we can help to get that message out so that tourists don't arrive here in April and um, not are not able to get into Arches. So we talked about ways to do that and using uh, the Travel Council as well to, to get that messaging forward. And um, that's all I have. Thanks, Jacques. Commissioner Walker. Okay. Um, so the, the biggest news is um, I, you know, Mary McGann and I for the past year or so have been trying to convince um, Moab City and San Juan County to, you know, up, up our games and Grand Canyon to up our games on collaboration for Spanish Valley. As we all know, Spanish Valley, it's like one small area, but it's got three different legislative bodies making decisions. And, um, and so I think we finally have a date for a joint meeting. Um, it'll be a week from today at 11 a.m., I hope, um, to um, pass a joint resolution. Um, I, you'll all get copies of that soon, but it basically just makes a non-binding promise to try to communicate and collaborate on issues that extend over our borders. And then it sets up a working group to, um, to facilitate communication and um, collaboration. So just a place to talk things over. All, all decision-making about applications would stay as it is. So this is, no, one, no entity is giving up any power, but we're just agreeing to talk to each other and try not to you know, have more conflicts than necessary. So I'm hoping at least a quorum of us can attend that, um, 11 a.m. on the 8th. Um, uh, so other items, um, you know, some work on a public lands proposal um, that's going a little bit slower than I hoped, but um, we are making progress and am looking forward to getting input from some retired federal land managers who have offered to help with that. Um, had a meeting with Nicole Gaddis Wyatt to talk about various BLM issues. Um, some you know, was reaching out for these Title V issues that are on our agenda today. Um, I, I admit I, I got I got surprised that they were on the agenda so soon. I, I think I must not have been listening carefully, but I, I I think it's all for the for the best because I think putting them on the agenda is prompting a lot of feed, um, input and feedback, and a lot of that's constructive. And I, I think we'll be able to get a, a better final product thanks to, the, to that. Um, oh, and then opera, but what, so in our citizens to be heard, it's, it's frustrating because we don't want to turn it into a big conversation and yet often people ask questions. And one thing we discussed in the past is if people can, commissioners can give their responses um, during this segment of the agenda. And so um, particular Graham Carpenter asked, you know, what are we trying to accomplish with these Title V revisions? I think Christina will have a lot more to say about that when the agenda item comes up and I will too, but just very briefly, um, part of it's tax enforcement. You know, we have reason to believe that not everyone is paying the taxes they should be paying, that it's both overnight accommodations and vehicle taxes. Some of it's just data so that we understand tourists coming in the Valley better. Um, and then also, and then some of it's related to noise ordinance enforcement. The, the noise requirements were passed quite a while ago, but we're sort of fine tuning how those will be enforced. So that, that's what we're trying to do. And I think we're trying to make it, we don't want it to be more burdensome than necessary. And I'm, I'm optimistic that when we're all done, it will, it will not be particularly burdensome on local businesses. Um, as Jacques mentioned, there was a responsible recreation meeting that he and I attended. I'm, I'm excited, you know, that seems to be ramping up and doing better. And hopefully soon this year, we'll have a new staff member on board who will be able to devote a larger percentage of their time to those projects. 
Um, and there was there was also a meeting with um, John Gunther about um, identifying, you know, we talk a lot about neighborhoods and when we're making PNZ decisions. And he wanted to actually map some out, you know, what, what are neighborhoods or, you know, clusters of neighborhoods. And, and the, you know, this could serve a lot of purposes. I think the one he has in mind is, you know, then convene a meeting, just asking people about planning and zoning decisions, you know, just in their very local area. Um, so that is the last thing I have to report on. Thanks, Kevin. I'll have to make sure to reach out to Mr. Carpenter with those points of clarity. Thanks for that. Uh, Commissioner Stock. Hello. Um, let's see, let me pull up my list. I attended the same land use code training and my takeaway from that is that our county attorney is doing a great job educating us on what kinds of things we need to say when we're making decisions about land use code. Um, I also attended the Moab Area Watershed Partnership meeting. Interesting as always. The same meeting that Kevin attended about neighborhoods and neighborhood delineation, um, I also attended. And I, there hasn't been a meeting yet, but I've been working, well, just had a few conversations with Alicia Oliver over at the Grand Center about reinstating the Council on Aging and getting that uh, committee up and running again. So hopefully soon we start meeting and um, more on that later. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clapper. I uh, also had some conversations around the uh, discussion later tonight. And um, I had a meeting with the Arches Special Service District that was uh, scheduled, but it, it didn't happen. So not much to report there. And um, the end of the month is always fairly quiet for me. So back at it now. Thanks, Evan. So I've been pretty busy. Um, land use training on the 19th, like everyone else had said. Um, I've been sitting in on UAC legislative policy meetings. There was one on the 20th, one on the 27th. Um, that's an interesting discussion. I can bring up some of the bills that um, are notable um, that, I, that I've come across um, on that agenda item that we have, um, speaking to that effect. Um, on the 25th, I attended the mental health uh, board meeting. Um, Four Corners Behavioral Health building up here in Moab here on Knob Hill is 70% done, uh, which is on schedule and they're scheduling a, a, a punch list walkthrough on April 7th to give you an idea of how that, um, that project is progressing. And we have a public hearing um, later on um, from Four Corners. Um, uh, also with, with regards to the Four Corners here in Grand County, um, staff has been very stable, really good news on that front. Um, so they've had, they've had um, 100 percent stable, uh, stable staff, zero turnover since September of 2021. Um, and, that, and they're fully staffed at the Willows and the clubhouse. So in spite of needing therapists, which is really a statewide and nationwide uh, shortage, um, staffing is really stable uh, with four corners. So that's really encouraging news. Right after that meeting was the Southeastern Utah Health Department uh, meeting, board meeting. And uh, Brady shared that um, the Omicron wave in Grand County, um, they've got it pegged at December 27th is when that wave reached Grand County. And the, the CDC is, has been shown based on other cases and other, other locations that, um, the, the, that wave is tending to last 28 to 32 days. Um, and Brady is expecting the same sort of pattern with Omicron. Um, and that would of course put us right, right now in sort of exiting that window of, of, that, of that Omicron wave um, trickling off. Um, so hopefully what we'll be seeing is a, is a, you know, a steady decrease in cases. Um, uh, but I thought that that was interesting and notable for us in the, in the scheme of uh, COVID and uh, vaccination rates been fairly static, but um, Grand County remains in the, the top third in the state among amongst counties and vaccination rates. Um, 
On the 27th, I attended the AOG meeting. Um, there's some going to be some grants coming online through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, so, as, you know, those are going to be coming in through grants.gov. Though I'm still waiting on more sort of direction and, and sort of clarity from the federal uh, delegation that attended um, with regards to how 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 um, the best way to apply to those and which ones are applied through the state and which ones are applied directly to the to the federal government. Um, so there were still a lot of questions that were un unable to be answered at the meeting. Um, and Congressman Curtis is planning a visit um, to the area this spring. I'm not sure if anyone's been in contact with him, but that might be something that we want to keep on our radar. Um, I'm not sure if there's any particular points, but it might be a good opportunity to talk with, interface with him one-on-one -on -one, um, with regards to the, pub, the uh, public lands process. Um, so that was just something that I wanted to, uh, to note. And I'm sitting in this week on uh, associate administrator, associate commission administrator interviews. And I think that that's, I think that that's all I've got to report at the moment. Um, not seeing Mary, so I don't think she's going to make it with us tonight. So I, I noticed that Christina Sloan is in the building. And no, hi, hair hi, ton, <laughs> no hair a ton for me tonight, so we'll just leave it at that for later agenda items. Thanks so much. Um, let's see, uh, Quinn. Clerk Auditor Quinn Hall, do you have any reports? Uh, no, I've been attending some of the Clerk Auditor legislative meetings right before the UAC ones, um, but other than that, I'm good. Great. All right, I think that that is it for elected officials. So we'll move on to Commission Administrator Report. Of course, the Commission Administrator Mallory Nassau is, in, is, is absent today, but I'll let uh, Chris Baird, Strategic Development Director, step in for reports on that account. Thank you, Gabe. So uh, first off, just want to let everybody know um, that our uh, Commission Office Assistant, Tara, has moved on to the airport. So she hasn't left uh, Grand County uh, entirely, but we're really going to miss her. And I uh, just wanted to you know, say how much uh, that we appreciated all of her years of work here in the office. And as Gabe indicated, we are in the process of hiring uh, the um, associate commission administrator as well as the, the office manager, which is the full-time version of the previous administrative assistant position. Um, also, I worked with uh, John Gunther, Sarah Stock, uh, Arnie Holquist, Dana Van Horn, and others on getting uh, the water monitoring grant application in. So. Um, expect that we'll hear back on that sometime soon. And of course, working on the uh, CIV application for Jackson Street Phase Two. Um, also, you know, in discussions with Moab Valley Fire uh, Protection District and potentially the Health District and others on some possibility that they may want to use our municipal billing authority um, to uh, comply with the Municipal Bonding Act on some loans that they want to do. So I've uh, been working with them on some things. Um, also met with Jones DeMille. Uh, we're kind of touched base once again on the uh, staffing analysis and office space um, feasibility study. So uh, hopefully try to get that rolling again soon. Uh, we did, you know, make an attempt last year when we were right in the middle of budget season and COVID was going crazy and just too difficult to pull it all together. So we're going to make another attempt at that. Of course, that all funnels into, uh, you know, designing uh, our space needs out 20 to 30 years from now and potentially uh, building some new office space to meet those needs. Um, also, you know, as, as some of you are aware, we budgeted last year for uh, potentially a movable stage uh, for local nonprofits and government use. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that we're probably going to need to put that out to bid, and so I'm going to work on producing an RFP for that, and then, um, you know, maybe with, I, I would hope within the next month we'd be able to get that back on the agenda for evaluation. I have heard that the city's uh, potentially going to consider uh, funding a portion of that at their next meeting, so I guess we'll be able to see how that plays out. Um, additionally, I'm working on um, updating and uh, potentially extending our general services agreement with our 
engineers of record, uh, Jones DeMille and Horrocks. Uh, and these are going to be necessary for a lot of the projects that I need to get going on here soon. Um, need to get going on the Spanish Valley uh, Bike Path Project, which is um, funded at this point pre predominantly by the hotspot recreational funding from the state. Uh, but I also need to get these agreements in place so we can move forward on the NRCS Pack Creek um, stormwater engineering project, the conveyance improvements there. And just to uh, kind of touch base with uh, the pickleball courts that Trisha brought up, um, you know, at this point we had budgeted 40000 as a contribution, uh, and so uh, I conveyed that to Annie McVeigh and, and others at the city so they're aware that we're willing to contribute uh, money. As far as I understand it, though, at this point they're actually having um, a public hearing or some type of public process uh, that they go through in order to choose a location for the pickleball courts. So it's actually a, some type of public process. And I think, you know, that, that kind of came, came about as a result of some of the contention from the uh, Bike Skills Park. And so uh, they're going through the process to figure out where uh, they place those pickleball courts. And so I assume if there, anybody has any uh, feedback that way, uh, that they would, you know, get in touch with city staff and present their opinions there. Uh, that's all I have for now, unless anybody has any questions for me. Thanks for that update. Any questions? All right. Seeing none, uh, we'll just cruise right along here um, into general business um, action items and discussion and consideration of item C. Uh, presentation and approval of a letter of support regarding the proposed UMTRA Thompson Special Service District Green River Pipeline Project. And I'll, um, I will invite John Ripley Corkery, who is the chair of the Thompson Special Service District, um, and Commissioner Hadeen to present. Hello from Thompson Springs. Um, this is John. Uh, First and foremost, I just really want to give a huge thanks to Trish for uh, working with us and helping us get this new board going um, and helping me personally to uh, understand what it takes to become a chairman of a special service district. So thank you so much, Trish, for, for being there for us. Um, you've, you've been a huge help. And uh, I'd also like to thank Chris Baird for all his support um, and Christina as well. And um, just uh, say that we're excited to work with Jacques moving forward here. So, um, yeah, I guess, uh, Trish, did you want to say anything or? No, I'll let you lead the way and then I might just wrap it up with a couple points that I have written down. Okay, thanks. Um, so just to give everybody a brief update, uh, the uh, we recently had a uh, our master plan our, uh, water update and it, uh, was a water study from Sunrise Engineering that showed that we had a water deficit here in Thompson Springs. Um, so we have been looking for new water sources to get us out of the deficit and to encourage growth and development in uh, this, this town, which is a, a rural hub deemed by Grand County. Um, so um, we've been looking at uh, two Two main sources. Uh, one is the BLM spring that's right on our pipeline. And um, that's kind of the low hanging fruit and something that's gonna happen fastest if we're able to get the permit from the BLM, which we have submitted for that BLM permit at this time. Um, and we're just uh, waiting for them to get back to us. And uh, we're very hopeful that uh, that will come through and help us get out of the water deficit and allow us to do some growth and development um, here in the near future in the next couple of years. Um, <clears throat> long term, we have an exciting opportunity that um, it's still in the preliminary phases, but it is, it is the UMTRA uh, Green River Pipeline. Um, basically, it's a uh, UMTRA uh, where they, they're taking all the tailings to in Crescent Junction has uh, had to have a, a pipeline all the way from Green River to spray down uh, the, the, the tailings as they come off the trucks um, so that the dust doesn't 
come up and, and uh, cause problems. And so they, they have a water right and they have um, a six inch pipeline. And that water right is about, is for 200 gallons per minute. Um, and like I said, it's a 22 mile of six inch pipeline. There's four pump stations. They have an 11 million gallon lined holding uh, pond for water storage and uh, four pump stations. So we have spoken to UMTRA about the possibility of taking over their infrastructure and their water right once their project is complete uh, in order to benefit Thompson Springs and Grand County. Um, the UMTRA project is supposedly gonna be completed in five to seven years, um, we're hoping. And so at that point in time, we would be able to uh, take over that uh, infrastructure and water right if they are willing to do that. And so we had a, a, an initial meeting with them at the Crescent Junction site and um, Russell McAllister said that uh, it's a very interesting possibility. And, you know, we feel that it would be such a great thing to have this toxic tailings mine scenario help out Thompson Springs in this awesome way by, you know, giving us water and allowing growth and development into the future. So he said to go ahead and, and you know, move forward with getting community support. And so we have had a um, public hearing in Thompson Springs about this and everybody at the meeting was on board. Um, and now we are coming to the Grand County Commission to ask for your support in helping us to push forward with UMTRA and the federal government on this um, case. And um, because we feel with, with county support that uh, UMTRA and the federal government will take us a lot more seriously. Um, we've also talked to the state, the Department of Drinking Water about this scenario. And they said that if the federal government were to give us the infrastructure and the water right, that they would see that as a match for a match grant um, scenario where we could gain the, uh, the funding to do the rest of the project, which would be adding another six miles of pipeline, another pump station, and a surface water treatment plant that would um, allow us to utilize surface, you know, the Green River water as culinary water. Um, so that's really exciting. And it is also, possible that we might be able to extend that line in the near future and utilize some of that water for irrigation until we're able to get further down the line, which would help us use our culinary water. Well, it would help our, it would help our culinary water situation since people wouldn't have to use culinary water for irrigation. So um, it, it's a very exciting scenario and like I said, we are now coming to you, the council, to ask for support. And I think that what would be awesome, if it's possible, would be to maybe like designate a commissioner, if it's Jacques or Trisha, to help uh, me and, and the TSSD approach UMTRA and try to get a commitment from them that would allow us a, a commitment that says, hey, we will provide you this infrastructure and water right if it makes sense. Um, and that sort of commitment would allow us to do a feasibility study. Well, it would allow us to go after funding for a feasibility study, um, which is sort of the next step um, in line. So yeah, that's kind of what um, I'm here today to talk about. And so I just want to see what you guys think and see if we can get some support and moving forward with this uh, with this concept. John, I have a question. It seemed like um, you referred to this, but so would it be the, the priority of the special service district to develop that spring, which you already have water rights to on BLM land and has fresh potable water? Or um, would you do this in lieu of that spring development? The, the spring is the priority. It's the low hanging fruit. It's something that could happen 
um, within the next year. Um, and that would give us the ability to grow and develop um, a decent amount and kind of get in a position to where the UMTRA pipeline could make more sense uh, financially. Because Thompson is so small right now that we kind of need to grow a little bit before we take on that big of a project. Um, but the UMTRA project would be the long term, the five to 10 year thing. And the, the, the BLM spring would be the you know one to two year project to get us out of the water deficit and allow for some growth and development to happen in the near future. Um, I, I had a question. So when you when you said there was a 40% um, water deficit, is that relative to what you're using right, right now? Like people don't have it, or is it relative to like a full build, build out or what's, you know, What's the denominator in that, that fraction? So the water deficit, the way that the state calculates uh, water usage in the, the, the system, basically we have an 85 gallon per minute uh, water source is what they've stated. Um, 32 gallons of that, 32 gallons per minute of that source are go to senior water rights holders, um, ranchers and the BLM uh, mainly. And, and then the, the rest of that is uh, the commercial users, such as the rest stops, uh, like UDOT and the rest stops, the gas stations. Um, we provide water to um, uh, Jackass Joe's um, jerky alien thing, a, a gas station, and also the 7-Eleven. Um, along with, we actually do provide culinary water to the Umptra Crescent Junction project, which is another interesting point in that we could use that same easement where we already have the existing water line to put in another water line. And so it would be relatively easy to do that. Um, and then all the residential customers, which the calculation that the state uses is 800 gallons per day for each uh, residential unit and also 950 gallons per day of outdoor irrigation water use for each residential unit. So 800 for indoor water use and 950 for outdoor water use. And that is kind of what puts us in the water deficit um, because that's saying 1,750 gallons per day per resident. And the average in Thompson is about 600 in the peak month, but the state says we have to use these certain calculations um, and then we have to take away some of that water for the, the senior water rights holders up the canyon. So we're still selling water because the senior water rights holders don't really, they don't use all their water. So we sell water through our loadout, but we can't utilize their water for permanent infrastructure. Um, so until we are able to obtain more water. And so we're kind of in a interesting scenario where Folks in town are like, well, you're selling all this water going out of, out of the loadout, but we can't get any more to develop our homes and whatnot. Um, and so we're, we're working to get out of that. But I, I hope that answered your question, Kevin. I'm not sure that. Um, it, it sort of answers it. So it's, so it's not like people's taps are running dry, right? And when you say, you know, 40% deficit sounds really big. No, and Kevin, to put it another way, and, um, and John explained it really well in detail, but to put it another way, it's relative to state requirements per user. Okay. So it, it's somewhat of a paper deficit rather than a wet deficit, but it's a legal requirement that the special service district has to deal with. Okay. So how much would this additional water allow Thompson Springs to grow? Do you have an idea of how many like residential units that could add? So 200 gallon per minute would, would equate to 720, 12,000 gallon per month residential unit equivalent, right? So 720 water taps, you know, I'm sure there's gonna be some sort of losses, you know, so let's just say 500 more homes could be put in Thompson Springs um, or some, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, some businesses, obviously, maybe not 500 homes, but maybe like several businesses and 400 homes or something like that. 
Um, the, the new spring source, if it brings in what we're hoping, would probably do a couple hundred more homes and also get us out of the water deficit. Um, so that's exciting as well. And yeah, so I, that's kind of the answer to your question, I guess. I mean, Sarah, one of the concerning things about the springs, and John has better numbers on this, is that those springs, specifically the main spring that they've been using, has slowly been on the decline. And, and quite a few of the Book Cliff springs are in this same scenario. Um, I don't know what the top was, JR. Was it like 200 gallons per minute? I can't remember the statistics. Do you have actual statistics on what the top, at least on paper what the top production was? Yes, um, I just recently sent that information over to Sunrise Engineering um, and back in the 90s, yeah, it was above 200 gallons per minute um, in several of the months that I looked at or in the upper 100s and it's just slowly been declining over the past 30 years, um, which, you know, so we could be in a scenario uh, it, where we start to have water issues if we don't develop the new spring. Um, and, you know, in the future, you know, the Green, the Green River pipeline concept is sort of the, it, you know, it's, it's the like the end all sort of thing. It's like the, that's like kind of the guaranteed water, whereas these springs can kind of keep declining over time, which is why we want to pursue the Umpture project um, for the long term, as as well as you know, the spring in the short term. So, so yeah. And the other thing I wanted to state too is we're we're also really going to be pushing water conservation efforts, um, and we're gonna we're working with the RCAC, which is something that Trisha helped us get started with, to develop a new fee structure with an inverse rate structure, um, which we don't currently have. It's actually your your second 15,000 gallons of water is cheaper than the first for residential users. And that doesn't make sense. So we're working with the RCAC to develop a new fee structure that will help to financially curb people from overusing water um, in the future. And the other thing that I wanted to say is, that, you know, this UMTRA project would cost several million dollars. Um, however, the concept would be to, um, do an assessment. So those 720 water taps that we sell or 500 or whatever it comes to um, would each be assessed a certain amount of money, say $5,000, $10,000 per tap uh, in order to pay off the any sort of loan that we take on. Um, and then, you know, with the, the, the added amount of income per month, we'd be able to uh, maintain that line, which would be expensive. Um, it's not going to be cheap water, but it's going to be, it would be water that would be very beneficial and I, it would be able to get paid for um, if we really look, if we place an assessment on it and if we really, you know, make sure to charge people the right amount for the, for the monthly usage. I looked up the water right because I was curious. Um, I've done in my previous work, a lot of work uh, analyzing the Lake Powell pipeline that is proposed. And that's so much bigger. It's um, hundreds of times bigger than this pipeline. But uh, it looks like that water right is actually has a better priority date than the Lake Powell pipeline water, which is good since I do feel like the Colorado River water isn't necessarily a surefire bet, but at least you'd be ahead of some other hopeful Utah developers. Cool, yeah, thanks for the, that input. I, I didn't know that, so I appreciate that. Yeah, I'll just kind of kind of just go over a couple things. Just just in, you know, we all know that we're in a, a an extreme drought um, and have been on the for you know forty years. So I think the fact is that towns specifically like Thompson that are dependent on one water source, it's it's extremely important to develop additional sources. I mean, John's already said that they're working on conservation and I think that's up, of utmost importance first and foremost, but I think also to develop other water sources when you can. I think anytime in the West right now we can 
gain water rights, specifically in this case to the Green River, I think we should regardless. And I also just love the idea of repurposing that line, right? That we just don't let it die out. You've put in that infrastructure, all that money was spent at one point, taxpayer dollars, and the idea of repurposing it to me is great. I want to state that, you know, JR is a volunteer on that board and it's amazing what he's done. It's absolutely amazing what he's learning. But the idea that he's got the foresight to be looking far into the future, I think is amazing. And, and I hope that the commission, you know, we, we can do all that we can to back you guys out there. So I failed to, I want to state, um, have the agenda summary together. He sent it to me and it, it was lost somewhere in Google Docs. So I think the goal with this item tonight is basically just to approve the idea that we support um, TSSD and moving forward with this UMTRA Green River Pipeline project. So I, I don't know, is that sort of like a, a kind of a, a bit of a vague non-binding show of support rather, yeah. Um, should we just leave it as a presentation or I, I guess I'm just wondering what is the actual benefit of us sort of making that? Um, I guess, um, and maybe Chris can solidify this, if we just move this, Chris, to actually writing a, a letter for the consent agenda for next time or, or the time after, is that appropriate? Oh, yeah. I think um, we should just all get together and put, you know, maybe, uh, you know, John can help us understand a little bit what the letter of support needs to look like, and then we can get it put together for the next agenda. I mean, this, this item doesn't fall under the action items section of our agenda, and so we really shouldn't take action on it. Um, but there's no letter to approve anyway. And so um, I think we can probably pull them together, though, in a couple weeks. So I, I would suggest getting something together and put it on the next agenda. So I, I have some concerns about doing it that quickly, especially since this is kind of a long-term plan. Um, I mean, five, 500 new homes in Thompson is, is a lot of homes, and it sounds like this project doesn't make sense unless you're increasing the tax base and have enough assessment. You know, it's, it's expensive to maintain a water treatment plant. It's ex expensive, expensive to maintain pumping stations. So this only makes sense if there's some pretty large-scale development in Thompson, which is something, you know, we maybe ought to think about in the general plan or something like that, or do a more thorough job of seeing what people in Thompson think about it. So it, to me, it just seems a bit rushed to go from, you know, this suddenly, you know, this, this large anticipated growth with a couple of discussions like this. Well, I think we should actually do the math a little, do the math a little more. Um, you know, as, as JR brought up, they're already 40% in the hole. So they need 40% more source capacity to even break even and, and have their existing uses be legal. And then, so, you know, if we get out of that deficit, you know, then how much more is, is left? And then, you know, we can evaluate the private property in the area and the zoning that, you know, that we might anticipate and try to, you know, make two and two equal four. And so maybe, JR, we should work on that and, and take a look at, you know, exactly how much more water do we need to break even and get compliant with state requirements? And then, you know, once that's extinguished, then, you know, take the remainder and try to calculate it, you know, based on uh, potential growth. So we can, you know, we can work on all that also and present that, you know, I, I'm willing to bet we could probably crunch those numbers, at, you know, at least in the basic sense by the next meeting. Okay. Well, I, uh, I attempted to crunch some of them just now, and it does seem to me that this project would only make sense if there's some you know, pretty large scale growth and development in, in Thompson. And to me, that sounds like a decision we should be making. That's kind of a general planning decision. That's not a you know, water decision. So I, I do think we get in trouble when we try to, you know, if there's not enough linkage between you know, water policy and, and other aspects of planning. Yeah, I would say if, if the pipeline is already coming into Grand County at the site, that um, pursuing those rights now would make sense. I, I think that we could move the ball in that direction without committing ourselves to actually developing the infrastructure. Um, obviously we wouldn't want to develop the infrastructure if we didn't 
have a certain guarantee of those water rights. And so maybe the this letter that uh, would is getting drafted would focus more on the rights and not so much a commitment to uh, deliver it to the town of Thompson. I'm not a water guy though, so maybe that's putting things yeah. out of work. Um, uh, Kevin, I totally understand where you're coming from with that. And I think that we're just kind of, um, really what we want to do is be able to have a feasibility study done to see, to see all these things that you're talking about, right. To see if this, how much it would cost and, you know, the feasibility study is going to do kind of just these things that you're, they're talking about. And so that's why we're trying to get UMCHA to sort of say, yes, um, we will do this uh, with you in theory, um, so long as it makes sense, so that we can move forward with asking the state Department of Drinking Water for a grant to do the feasibility study. Um, and if the feasibility study comes back and says that it's, uh, you know, this is a great idea, then I think we could move forward with all the planning and zoning stuff. If it comes back and says it's not a good idea, well, then, you know, we're kind of where we're at. And, you know, but also I feel like um, the new spring source, if we're able to get that from the BLM, will help to Thompson to develop um, a little bit. And that, you know, this, all this stuff is several years away, but um, I think trying to get that commitment from UMTRA so that we can do a feasibility study would certainly be a big benefit in moving forward. Thanks. Thanks, John. Yeah, I would say that I, I you know, I, I agree with Evan that sort of you know, taking these steps to pursue the, that, that water right, I think is a good idea. I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea of you know, building, you know, the, as, as worded in the presentation, building a model sustainable community. But I also share the same concerns that Kevin is, you know, you know, that uh, raises about sort of what, what is the actual goal here and how does that fit within, um, you know, what, what the, you know, what the needs of the county are and sort of the, the idea, for example, of rebuilding the Thompson Springs train station, I think is really, um, I think is really desirable and would be a great benefit to all of the residents of Grant County um, and obviously developing affordable uh, residential homes and more residential units. Um, but I think also like the idea of like overnight accommodation units and destination epicenter for a desert adventure, that kind of stuff. I mean, it seems like we might have enough of that. So I'm, I'm much, all, all I'll say is I'm much more intrigued by the idea of Thompson as uh, you know, presenting a new paradigm uh, in the context of Grand County than um, than sort of developing what we have already. That's very quite robust. Um, but is there any other discussion that anyone else wants to uh, add at this moment? I just say that I think that infrastructure might be um, desirable for other people as well, like state or potash or something like that you know so timing is probably of that like even though it's a long-term project there's probably other players so timing mm -hmm. so Chris how would you just really quick Chris um are you willing to work with JR as kind of moving forward with crafting some letter even if it's just the idea of acquiring that water right and the infrastructure at the beginning. Yeah. I don't know. I Certainly. I, I, can, kind of yeah, I can work with you, JR. Uh, we can, we just need to, uh, you know, I guess figure out what kind of support um, you need right now. And maybe we can get a, you know, some kind of uh, meeting together with Russell McAllister and discuss. Um, okay. But it does sound, you know, like it's probably, um, you know, a fairly extensive process. And so I think, you know, the commission might want to approve a letter of support with, you know, some caveats, um, you know, that revolve around some of the issues that Kevin brought up and others. 
Um, but, you know, whether it's feasible or not is difficult to say. And, you know, I, I, I guess I have to admit that it's difficult to support a project if you don't know if it's feasible yet. Um, but we can certainly endorse, you know, progress on a feasibility study and, if feasible, you know, support for the thing. So I just need a little better understanding, I think, of what uh, what goals you're hoping to accomplish with, with the letter of support at this point in time. Okay, and, and yeah, I there there was a letter drafted. I, I don't I guess you guys didn't get it, but I, I did send it to Mallory. Um, so Chris, I'll send that over to you and work with you on that. And and yeah, it's like I said, this is just a, a general support um, from the county, so that when we go to UMTRA, you know, we actually have county support in 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 being able to do a feasibility study. I think that's the that's the next step. So. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll be in touch with you about that and really appreciate your help on that. And, and thanks to everybody for listening. And, you know, it's a, it's a great idea, but there's, you know, a lot of hoops and things to jump over. And, um, you know, that obviously as, as, as Kevin stated that there's some things that the county's got to look at to see if this is makes sense and is what the county wants to do and totally understand that. Just, uh, wanted to bring this up as it's a really interesting idea and could be a big benefit to the county if it all makes sense. Thanks, John. Um, thanks, Chris. It looks like we have a reasonable path forward there. And so I'm sure we'll continue to be in touch. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, um, unless, without, unless there are objections, I'm gonna go ahead and move, um, move on to item D on our agenda. Um, and the title is Approving Additions to the 2021 Property Tax abatements and cancellations. And I'll introduce Chris Kaufman, Grand County Treasurer. Thank you, Gabriel. Can you hear me? I can, yep. Great. <clears throat> so uh, as Gabriel mentioned, um, I'm presenting additional property tax abatements and cancellations for last year for the commission to approve the financial impact, uh, which is spread across all taxing entities is about $475,000. Um, approximately 4,000 of that would be reimbursed by the state. So back in October, uh, just before tax bills were being sent out, uh, I brought all the abatements and cancellations we had up to that point to the commission for approval. So this is just gonna cover everything from September 29th to the end of the year. We did receive a handful of additional real and uh, personal property abatements. Uh, for disabled veterans, disabled low-income individuals, and low-income seniors. That totaled about $12,000. We'll get about $4,000 back of, of that from the state. Uh, the cancellations are kind of the big story on uh, this uh, agenda item. They totaled about $463,000. Um, that is unusually, unusually high, and uh, I will get into the reasons why in just a moment. Uh, but all of the cancellations that comprise that number are included on a spreadsheet, which were in your packet. Um, about 973 of those were in penalty cancellations. Uh, we had a small amount in personal property write-offs, and we had uh, about 6,000 in just sort of random cancellations for different reasons. Um, the big number is in prior year cancellations, uh, which is about 456,000. And um, those were due to two centrally assessed taxpayers and their various issues, which I'll jump into in one moment. I did want to mention that two of the cancellations on the list um, have already been approved by the commission at, at prior meetings. Um, so to dive into the, the big cancellations, uh, the first one is from Harley Dome. And before I get going, just as a refresher, these are uh, centrally assessed taxpayers, which means that um, our local assessor does not come up with the value for these. The state tax commission values these taxpayers' property and then tells the county how much value is in the county and uh, we assess the tax on that value. Um, and so Harley Dome uh, is, a, is or was a, a wastewater injection plant um, out on I-70 near the Colorado border. Uh, they stopped paying their taxes in 2014 and, and racked up some tax bills uh, for four years uh, to 2017, but they filed for bankruptcy in 2016. Uh, 
And then in 2018, there was a separate court action, uh, separate from the bankruptcy, that granted a new owner um, uh, the ownership of the property that the property tax was owed on, and that judgment gave it to the new owner free and clear of any property taxes. So this unfortunately stripped Grand County's ability to recover the taxes through tax sale. And so we were left in the position to just wait around and see if the bankruptcy um, produced any funds for us. Uh, unfortunately, there were no funds available to uh, pay unsecured creditors. The bankruptcy did finally wrap up just a few months ago in November of 21. And uh, so with no um, property uh, as collateral or, or leverage for these property taxes and the uh, company uh, in bankruptcy and the bankruptcy concluded, we really don't have any other option but to cancel all those taxes. Um, and the total for those four years uh, with the interest and penalty that it accrued uh, was about $258,000. Um, before I move on to the next one, were there any questions about Harley Dome or what happened with it? No, it's just, that's just a really discouraging story, I guess, specifically in, in the light that we're, uh, you know, facing this idea of possibly running a highway. And I want to state that the new alignment actually runs strangely close to those wastewater treatment plants. And that wastewater comes out of gas and oil wells off the Uinta Basin. And so it's being brought down and put and deposited there, right? So I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's just discouraging. So I'm going to try to keep my mouth shut. Obviously, I didn't do a very good job, but. Yes, and this bankruptcy was, was a really big bankruptcy. Um, the Harley Dome was just a tiny, tiny part of it. Um, it was a giant corporation called Armada Water. And uh, I think it was the general downturn in the oil and gas market that uh, forced them into bankruptcy. But um, there were. Uh, a whole lot of other assets involved in the bankruptcy. We were just a tiny portion of it. Chris, I, sorry if this is something you don't know, but I'm, I was just curious about how someone else got the property you know, without having to pay the back taxes. Is that common or is something weird happen? Do you know? It's a, it's a really good question. Um, I haven't seen it happen before or since. Um, and uh, what I can tell you is that um, there was a mechanics lien on the property uh, from someone who did some sort of, I believe it was electrical work um, out there at Harley Dome. And so they enforced their lien and somehow Grand County did not um, uh, exert their interest in the property tax at that time. Um, if Christine is still on, um, it, she wasn't here when this happened as attorney, but um, she does know a little bit about it. And so maybe, I don't know if she can fill in any more details there. I'm here, but I can't fill in any more details. This was with the prior attorney and we, uh, we, we don't know exactly how Grand County got, um, didn't get in on that action. Okay, so, so maybe Grand County dropped the ball or maybe it was just bad luck from our point of view. We don't, we're not sure which. I think that's accurate. Okay, if there's no other questions about Harley Dome, I'll uh, move on to Union Pacific Railroad. Um, they are another large centrally assessed taxpayer um, and they started filing appeals uh, with the state tax commission uh, against the state's valuation of their property. Uh, they started that in 2018, continued into 2021. So there were four years of appeals that had stacked up. Um, and uh, this year the counties and the state reached a settlement agreement with UPR uh, that covered all of those years. Uh, the counties actually had been doing quite well in court against UPR, um, and uh, most of the court uh, actions that were settled had held up the, um, the state's valuation, uh, so UPR wasn't in a great negotiating position. So the counties and the states uh, agreed to a relatively small reduction in their value. Um, uh, we also agreed to forego some interest and penalty for a few years and uh, the resulting cancellation of taxes and interest and penalty totaled approximately $198,000 for Grand County. Um, and to kind of put that into perspective, um, the total property taxes they would have owed for over those four years would have been um, over $4 million. So 198,000 out of that is relatively small. And it did get us out of years and years of continued litigation. Um, 
on on the the other years that had not been litigated yet. And we also think that this settlement is going to um, uh, result in UPR not uh, filing more actions, at least for a while. So that's another positive on it. Um, but this is this is a a court ordered agreement, and so we don't really have a lot of choice on uh, on this one. Uh, but the the result is that we're going to cancel about one hundred ninety eight thousand. And, and Chris, while this is being litigated, were they paying some? large fraction of that $4 million, or are we suddenly going to get a $4 million check? Uh, good question. Um, so in 2018, they uh, got a federal court to allow them to put the disputed amount of taxes, so the difference between what they thought they should pay and what uh, their taxes tax bill was, uh, to put that into escrow. So UPR paid that money out, but it's been sitting in an account uh, these four years. In 2020, UPR uh, paid their, or I'm sorry, in 2019, they paid their full bill, um, which is normally what companies do, even under appeal, they, they pay the full tax. And if they get a, um, a, a settlement in their favor, we send them a refund. Uh, but then in 2021, UPR, again, dis they decided of their own accord to only pay the undisputed taxes and to just keep the part they didn't think they should pay, even though they didn't have permission to do so. Um, uh, that was in 2020. And uh, then in 2021, uh, the settlement agreement was basically happening um, at the time that taxes were due. So um, that's a long answer for uh, for what you're trying to get at, which is that no, it won't be the total 4 million, but it was a pretty, pretty big chunk. Um, I want to say the two years that they didn't pay the full amount was uh, about 330,000 uh, each, something like that. So um, we did receive uh, in excess of $600,000 in um, back taxes uh, that, uh, that we did recede in um, and are going out to the taxing entities. I'll be dispersing that. Um, and we dispersed that in January actually. And then we did receive the full uh, 2021 payment, which was uh, about 1.1 million. Any other yeah, questions? My, my main question, which you addressed, was if they're going to continue to appeal moving forward, and it sounds like hopefully they won't. Yes, our our lawyer says that they usually um, appeal for a while and then see how they do in court and then step back. And again, they were not super successful in court. Um, uh, you know, they did get a concession from the counties and the state, and and you know. This is like a lot of areas of life where if you're if you're big and you've got a lot of money, you can throw your weight around, and and they did. Uh, but hopefully, they will stop doing that for a while. So Thanks, uh, there was yeah, there was one oh, other okay. thing I wanted to mention on the list of cancellations. Um, it happened in uh, September in uh, December, uh, and uh, it involves uh, an individual who um, applied has been applying for and receiving the circuit breaker tax abatement for many years. Um, it's an elderly low income individual who lives by themselves. And um, they got concerned this year, last year about um, what would happen after they died and, and who would get their property. And so uh, they uh, put a different person as the owner on their property and took themselves off. Um, that they didn't realize at the time that that would make them ineligible for the for the the tax abatement. Uh, we made them aware of this, and they went ahead and put themselves back on as an owner, along with the the other person that they want the property to go to. Um, so they were technically ineligible for the circuit breaker, and so we weren't able to give them that abatement. Um, however, it's my recommendation that uh, we go ahead and cancel the amount of taxes that they would have received um, as a, a in tax relief uh, because the their their living circumstances never changed. Um, their income didn't change. They lived in the home the entire time. It was really just a couple months where the ownership changed um, for understandable reasons and it's been uh, fixed now. So they will continue to get the circuit breaker in following years. So if, if you do approve the, the motion tonight, it will include that cancellation as well. Can you speak to uh, a special service district being listed here? And uh, it looks like the the veterans relief and 
think were applied towards that. Um, can you tell me which report you're looking at? Uh, the at the bottom there's the Arches Special Service District report. Um, uh, it is the Auditor's District Entity Abatement Report. Okay, give me just a moment. It's got, I mean, it's all kind of, uh, it's the city, Spanish Valley, Elgin, mosquito abatement, and- uh, Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so this, this report is just um, separating out um, where the different abatements for the whole year um, ended up in those various taxing districts. So um, it doesn't have anything to do with the district itself, really. It's just showing uh, where all those abatements are happening, like if that makes sense. Uh, so is the Arches Special Service District collecting uh, a tax revenue now? No, they're not. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, we have a lot of taxing districts that are, that are no longer uh, relevant. Um, so we still have, you know, a Thompson Water Special Service District and you can see Elgin on there and stuff like that, that that don't have any bearing anymore. But they're still in the system as official taxing districts that are out there. But there is no tax um, being levied from those places. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much for your time. Are there any other questions? If there aren't any other questions or if you, there are, please go ahead. Or I, was, I would also entertain a motion. Um, I'll go ahead and make the motion, we can ask questions later, I guess. So I move to approve the additional 2021 property tax abatements and cancellations as presented. Thanks, Commissioner Walker, do I have a second? Second. And no, further discussion? I, um, not a question, but I just wanna thank Chris for you know his, his reports are consistently very readable and interesting, so. Thank, thanks for continuing to do a good job on these, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Chris Kaufman. Any other any other questions or discussion? All right. Well, we had a motion on the floor by Commissioner Walker, second by Commissioner Clapper. I'll call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Let's see. Sarah, um, you're not on my screen. Can I get an aye from you? Aye. Thank you. Vote passes unanimously. Moving on to item E, approving chair's signature on a document for the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program with the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration for the airports. And um, we have Andrew Solzvig, airport director on the call to present. Good evening, County Commissioners, County staff, and the general public. Andrew Solzweig, Airport Director. Every three years, the, um, an airport is required to prepare uh, goals for disadvantaged business enterprise as part of uh, requirements to receive grant funding. Uh, the, the agenda summary provides a brief description as to the reason why. Uh, this is just a document to move forward with the program itself and then a goal will be set. And basically the goal is just a percentage that you wanna do due diligence to try to find a DBE as part of the, a federal project. Unless there's any further questions. Any questions or a motion? I would uh, move to approve the County Commission Chair signing the Department of Transportation DBE program uh, 49 CFR part 26 policy statement as part of the Canyonlands Regional Airport Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program. Thank you, Jacques. Do I have a second? All right, thanks, Kevin. And I would invite any further discussion of this item at this time. Not seeing any, so we had a motion on the floor by Commissioner Hadler, second by Commissioner Walker. I'll call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Aye. Trish, do I got an aye from you? No, Sarah. Oh. 
Thanks, Sarah. Let's see. I didn't get I didn't get an indication from Trish. She's not on my screen. Trish, wait, that's all. She, she um, voted yes. Yeah. Great. Vote passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, moving on to item F, approving, approving lease agreement with Red Tail Jet Center for office space in the airport terminal. Mr. Solzvig. Good afternoon once again, airport director here. Um, the previous Red Tail Jet Center agreement had expired and that agreement had everything consolidated into one. Um, what we are trying to do is break out some um, break out the agreements that that make a little more sense, since some of them will have different terms and conditions than others depending on the type of use. So this agreement in particular is for their office space inside the terminal, um, and I'm just making sure I'm looking at the correct one here. Uh, It would be for three years with some extensions and uh, just coincides with their operation. Their main office operations is in the terminal and um, just like to initiate a lease agreement with them. And, and so this is, so this, nothing new is happening at the airport. This is just renewing a lease. That is correct. So no, no, no big changes here. No big changes. Okay. It's existing uh, area that they had been leasing in the past. We're just establishing a new agreement. Okay. And am I remembering correctly that it used to be called Red Tail Aviation? I wasn't aware they changed their name. It was. Uh, in fact, good question. They just changed to Red Tail Jet Center as of uh, this year or just a few months ago. And so um, they're just kind of um, sort of rebranding and wanting to be more significant in the fixed based operation world. Can you translate that for me, fixed-based operation? Sure. So um, airports have what's called fixed-based operators, and those are companies that provide uh, fueling to general aviation and commercial aircraft. So like the United or the Deltas, uh, they do the fueling services. But in addition, depending on the size and operation of a what's called an FBO for short, they uh, also provide maintenance services. This one here also does what's called Part 135 operation, which is for higher operations. This will include their um, river tours, the scenic flights that they do in the area, any um, private charters that they perform. So there's a, there's a mix of operations involved with, um, with their business model. And so uh, the key ones, and again, one that they could add is, um, is flight training. And then they sort of manage the apron with um, all of the general aviation activities. So there's quite a few things that they do on here. It's very common at any airport to have an FBO. Thank you sure. for the information. Any other questions? I can make them. Please. Um, I move to approve an airport property terminal lease agreement for office space between Red Tail Jet Center and Grand County. I have a second. Thank you, Evan. Oh, and, uh, any further discussion? All right, I'll call for a vote. We had, um, we had a motion on the floor by Commissioner Walker, a second by Commissioner Clapper. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Vote passes unanimously. Thank you. And then we'll move on to G, approving lease agreement with Red Tail Jet Center for retail space in the airport terminal. Thank you once again, airport director here. Um, this is a separate agreement because it's specifically for retail space. Retail space can come and go as needed. Um, they had not done this uh, until recently with the request. So they just want to have the ability to sell product, um, could be mugs, hats, um, bags, uh, stickers, what have you. And so this is just really floor space that they'll be using for their kiosks and merchandise. Um, the nice thing about us having a separate agreement and not tying it with their office is because there might come a time where we need to relocate um, the merchandise or uh, end it all together, not saying that's the case, but it just allows more flexibility 
And, um, you know, retail rates or floor space might be a little bit different than some other lease space. Uh, so it just kind of depends. We just wanted to have different agreements for that reason. Any other questions? I'll make a motion. Uh, I move to approve an airport property terminal lease agreement for retail space between Red Tail Jet Center and Grand County. Thanks, Sarah. Do I have a second? I'll second, Gabe. All right. Um, any further discussion? All right. Uh, we had a motion on the floor by Commissioner a second by Commissioner Hadler. Um, and I will go ahead and call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. All right. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, moving on here, I think we weren't quite ready for um, item H here on our agenda, so I would entertain a motion to postpone. So moved. Sorry, what agenda item is that? Approving extension. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. I should probably call it out. Huh? Approving extension of on-call engineering services with Horrocks and Jones and DeMille. Chris, can you corroborate that um, we're not ready for this one? Yes, corroborated. We're still working on um, pulling together the um, rate tables and, and uh, updating the uh, inner, the, uh, the ICA, the contract to, to our modern form. And so I believe that we'll, we should be able to enact a two-year extension to the previous two general services agreement agreements. However, uh, like I say, I think we need to update the independent contractors agreement and also uh, update the rate tables and whatnot. So still need to get that together. Thank you. I had a motion to postpone on the floor by Commissioner Clapper. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner Hedin. Were there any uh, any discussion or comments? Christina, did you have anything to add? No? I didn't, thanks. Okay, great. Um, motion by Commissioner Clapper, second by Commissioner Hedin. Um, all of those in favor for this motion to postpone, raise your hand or say aye. Passes unanimously, thank you. Moving on to item I, adopting an ordinance initiating a temporary land use regulation prohibiting the erection, construction, reconstruction, or alteration of any building or structure or any subdivision approval requiring new water connections within the Thompson Special Service District boundary. Christina. Okay, we've heard a lot about Thompson water already tonight. I think you guys have a good sense. Um, we do have a moratorium in place that is terminating um, naturally this week. Uh, the basis for that moratorium was um, a suspicion that there was insufficient water and the need for a water study. That water study has been done, and as you heard, it found that there's a 40% deficit um, in the water supply in Thompson. They cannot legally um, permit new water or provide new water connections. Um, now we need more time to develop that water. You heard about the BLM um, surface water right development proposal. I did speak with the BLM and they confirmed it will be likely up to a year. It is possible it would get approved um, before that, but it's unlikely and it is the federal government. Um, so, uh, you know, there's going to be, it's going to be some time. By state statute, there is a six month limitation on these temporary land use regulations. Um, keep in mind, the point of this moratorium is really just public notice. So state law generally integrated into case law in the state of Utah requires for all new development, subdivisions, uh, construction, that the owner developer provide legal access and water. So that's state law already. In addition, our land use code in section 7.8 codifies the exact same requirement that an owner development developer has to prove up sufficient water supply. The county and its discretion gets to decide that. We can also confer with, with different referral agencies that are listed there, okay? So those are our primary reasons why we would deny 
any new development, subdivision, construction in Thompson anyway. The point of this moratorium is really to give the public notice that uh, we can't approve new development in Thompson until new water supply is um, approved and also gives the SSD some cover because it's an easy thing to show people and, and they have their own moratorium that they put in place as well. The basis for this moratorium is different and it starts over a new moratorium. It's not an extension of what we have. It is a new moratorium based on the facts today, which is we've recently gotten a water study that shows there's a 40% deficit and we can't improve new development until new water supply is approved. I do expect we will have to issue another moratorium because I don't expect that new development to happen within six months, but we do have that statutory limitation. So the, the, the legislature wants us to review this within six months to make sure we still have a basis to um, impose this requirement. Can I just add that um, I do appreciate the county doing this because it the TSSD is under a lot of pressure from developers to just keep pushing out water taps and they don't have that capacity. So it's just great that it comes from a larger entity. Yeah, and I mean, just today, I got a question from PNZ about a new development. Thompson SSD had already provided a very detailed denial of a new water connection. And yet the applicant comes to our PNZ and says, but you can't, can't you approve it anyway? No, we can't approve it anyway. And so, you know, I, I really gave um, our PNZ staff um, good detail on the state law status, our land use code, and that basis, and then this moratorium that will be at a third reason to deny. So I would move to adopt the ordinance enacting a temporary land use regulation prohibiting the erection, construction, reconstruction, or alteration of any building or structure or any subdivision approved requiring new water connections within the Thompson Special Service District boundary. Thank you, Trish. Do I have a second? Drop a second. Uh, any further discussion on this item? <clears throat> All right, we have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Hadeen, second by Commissioner Hadler, and I'll go ahead and call for a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Vote passes unanimously. All right, moving on to agenda item J, repealing Title V of the Grand County General Ordinances and Related Ordinance Number 632 and adopting new Title V business license. Uh, Christina Sloan, Grand County Attorney. I'll take the lead on this. I, I have several people I'm gonna punt to as well. Kevin Walker is one, Quinn, likely Josh Green who's here. I'm not sure if August is here. He might be able to provide some information on the um, software. It doesn't look like he is. Um, uh, let me give a general introduction. And then we have been, um, we've received many comments on this. Um, and so I have made some tweaks to the language that's in the packet that I wanna show everyone, including the public, and talk through that. Um, and there's still some choose your own adventure language for us to discuss. Based on the community interest, our business community's interest in this, um, Kevin and I, I have already given you a heads up that we'd like to discuss it tonight, but likely a motion to table until the next meeting makes sense so we can spend a little bit more time, talk to some more business owners about their concerns. Just by way of background, um, our business licensing regulations are codified in our general county code. That is found, if you Google Grand County Ordinances, you'll pull up are these, these various titles which create our, our county code, which is separate from our land use code. That's where all of our administrative law is placed. Um, our business licensing, of course, goes back forever. Um, but last year, in the, at the beginning of the year, essentially, we started a massive effort to update the business licensing regulations, somewhat driven um, by the interest in regulating ATV businesses um, in conjunction with our noise ordinance. Uh, but there is also some other cleanup to do. Our first big update to Title V was passed last April 15th. And many of the comments that we have received from our business community were actually passed in April of 2021. Um, so those have been in place for nearly a year. 
Um, and we haven't heard from those businesses until now. I think they weren't aware of, of some of these provisions. Um, in June, the Title V was amended again to address the reciprocal licensing issue with the city of Moab. And now we're at our third effort. Um, there are sort of three parts to this update. One is to address timelines and noise testing procedures that we passed back in April, 2021. We need to get that passed by the end of February. Actually, our current requirement is that our ATV businesses were supposed to have tested by the end of January. We're granting everyone an extension. And the point of that is that uh, it became clear that ATV fleets largely turn over between about November and January um, for just sort of annual fleet maintenance. Um, our season seems to be starting earlier and earlier. So by the holiday weekend of February, most of these fleets are set. Um, the whole point of testing the fleet is before the season starts. So we're trying to find that perfect window where our ATV fleets are set for the season. Um, uh, and, and then, but we also have time to test. So we're just pushing it back a month. And currently, um, and I know some people have found out about this are upset and I do want to explain it. Currently, uh, there's an expectation and it's not really addressed, but an expectation that every single uh, ATV and an ATV fleet would be um, tested. It is um, really inefficient. And I want, you know, Josh Green can talk to this piece um, when we go through, I'll, I'll punt to you then, Josh. Um, but it, it's an efficient process. It has been really difficult to even get two half days of scheduling out of the sheriff's office. Um, the city police gets a lot of attention for how understaffed they are, but by percentage wise, the sheriff's office is just as understaffed as the city of Moab. So just from a pure staffing standpoint, it's been really hard to schedule these. We just don't have staffing capacity to test every single vehicle. And, and I support Josh and the sheriff's um, idea that it's just not necessary that we can um, test all the like kind vehicles, meaning make, model, mileage, and modifications. And Josh will be able to confirm all that because we have ATP fleet inventories. Okay, so that's one chunk. It's very just a little administrative thing. It's somewhat minor. We need to get done by the end of February. One chunk is requiring uh, reservation reporting from how it's set up now is overnight accommodation businesses and motor vehicle businesses. That is largely driven by wanting to understand and study in more detail um, tourism information, reservation information, how our midweek um, tourism versus weekend tourism is looking, how are our seasons looking these days. Um, overnight accommodations and motor vehicles, um, it, it's structured to capture those right now because one, those are the businesses our community has the most interest in, but they're also, you know, some of our bigger, faster growing um, industries. And Kevin will talk to that too once we go through it. And then the third part of it is tax education and support. We do have access to state tax filings and we are um, allowed and do uh, review those and investigate potential underreporting um, or non-reporting by our businesses in Grand County. Um, what we have found, and Chris Baird can talk to this piece, what we, what we found or we suspect is there's um, underreporting going on. Um, we do trigger audits now and then through the Utah Tax Commission, but they have limited capacity um, to audit people upon request as well. Um, and we are starting from the assumption that our businesses need more education and more support. And the Utah Tax Commission has a lot of educational resources out there and they're underutilized by businesses across the state. We are not the only county really honing in on this. And I talked again, you know, I've had many conversations with folks at the Utah Tax Commission, but I did talk again with someone in the sales tax division today. And she said, rural Utah in particular, numerous counties are taking the same steps we are, which is requiring um, proof of attendance at a tax workshop prior to licensing, um, and also some sort of filing requirement to prove up that taxes are being filed. Some counties are requiring that the tax returns be filed with the county. San Juan County is one of those that the Utah Tax Commission alerted me to. Um, we are not, we are, we do have a very strict obligation under law to keep all tax returns confidential. And we can't release them, we can't disclose them. And, and I don't think we have adequate systems and software set up right now to, to adequately protect that, I'm concerned. So I'm not 
suggesting we go there. I think the sales tax affidavit structure that we have set up is sufficient. And that's also something um, that the tax commission said other, um, other communities are doing. Um, I think it makes sense. So that's just by way of background. I think it makes sense now to dig in um, and then punt to um, my other co-presenters then. But if my co-presenters would rather um, give their spiel now, um, that's fine too. Kevin, what do you think? <laughs> what do I think about the order of discussion? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm easy. <laughs> so. Josh, what do you think? I can go ahead and discuss the changes that we made, if, if you would like, and then that way it could be discussed and have a better understanding of why we did it. Sure. And I think um, the ones that you are involved in are the least controversial. So why don't why don't you start? Do you want me to screen share that section or? That, that would be wonderful because I was going to alt tab between the windows. So if you could do that, okay. I appreciate it. As you're talking, I'll, um, I'll get there. Okay. So um, when I took, took over for code enforcement back in June, one of the first things I did was tackle Title V to look at it because uh, we knew that there was going to be um, sound testing coming up and, and uh, we wanted to make sure that it was super efficient, not only for the county, but also for the, um, the business owners as well. One of the biggest issues that I noticed um, immediately was that we were going to be testing machines in November and December. And those machines, because I have experience with, off, with an off-road business, those machines are turned over at the end of the year. So I would be essentially testing machines that were not even going to be in Grand County. And it just kind of seemed like a, a waste of time for, for all parties involved. Um, it, and the other thing that I saw was that testing every machine would be um, very time consuming for both, like Christine had mentioned, both for, for code enforcement and for the Grand County Sheriff's Office because uh, their time is extremely valuable and trying to get a day where we can have them come and help us was, was uh, you know, it took us about two and a half months just to get these two days picked. So what we did was, is we went in and we made it to, to we pushed back those dates. And that way we would get um, a testing of those, um, those machines that are coming in. So we would be testing machines that were going to be in the area. Um, another thing that we decided to do, and this is actually one of the business owners had spoken to me and gave me the idea for this was instead of testing every machine test like, machines. So like machine would be make model year. So if they had 10 Polaris razors and they were all 2021s, only one of those machines randomly chosen would be, uh, would, would be the machine that got tested. The other machines would be looked at for their mufflers and uh, to make sure that we weren't putting in, uh, that there wasn't any um, muffler um, that were being added on to make the machine louder. But um, from my history with, uh, with the ATV businesses, uh, if you modify the muffler in any way at all, you void the warranty on the machine. Now, the machine, the companies that build machines will warranty, warranty these machines up to three years. So uh, that means if a customer blows an engine on one, if they, find, if, if they see that muffler is not uh, modified, then, I mean, they'll, they'll replace that engine a, a, as soon as possible. So it's not really in the best interest of the business owners to modify their mufflers to be louder. So what we did was, is we said we take a like machine and then we would also produce an affidavit that was uh, signed by the business owner that states they will not modify their muffler because this will be after we test. And they would say they would not modify their muffler and they would not, um, and they would notify us if they did modify their muffler to be quieter. We're encouraging them to make their mufflers quieter. Uh, that would help with the sound, um, complaints and the noise complaints that we've been getting. Um, it's, it'll be pretty straightforward. Uh, Christina um, will be writing it up pretty soon and uh, we'll have that signed on everybody. Um, the, and it'll essentially just say what is here, 5.02.050. It'll, you know, it'll be in an affidavit form and it'll have this exact same language. Yes. And, and one of the things I noticed too was, is we, we passed everything, but we didn't have any documents created for the business owners to report. So we, I went into um, an Excel program and I created a, um, a, a spreadsheet for them that can get emailed to them with drop down menus of years, makes, models, all of those things, what type of vehicle it is to kind of, that way we could have one um, 
one way of doing this all the way across the board. So it wasn't just like a bunch of, you know, handwritten things being turned in. We would have, we would have something that not only I could look at, but the sheriff's office could look at and the um, auditor's office could look at. So, um, and that affidavit would be attached to those as well. Um, once, um, obviously once they, they pass, they get a certificate of compliance, which I also designed, um, that'll be handed to them. And then a copy of it will be given to the, um, the, the auditor's office that could be um, asked for and brought up at any, any point that we needed it. Um, the other thing that uh, I noticed with, with it and with, and uh, is th the way that the logos and the, the numbers on the side of the logos, they weren't, it didn't really make sense how they were set up. So th the previous um, ordinance stated that the logo had to be, that'd be a, a white logo with a, with a, or a black logo with a white background and um, the side and a number on the passenger side of the machine. So, and, and then also a whip flag with that unique identifying number. And so what do you do if you see something illegal happening from the driver's side, you don't know what business is, is there. And the whole point of this is so, so there could be reporting of anybody that's going off trail, things like that. Uh, so what we did was, is with, um, Christina and I, came up with it to be a logo that's legible from 50 feet away. So the white background was just kind of something that got added in there by um, just kind of uh, a mistake more than anything. Uh, we, so we went with a logo that was identifiable up to 50 feet away. And the original idea was just to have the whip flag with the identification number on it. But after talking to the planning commission last week, because I presented this to them, the um, it was brought up uh, that the whip flags would be very hard to read. So if we just had a whip flag with a number on them, the person seeing what was happening would not be able to identify what machine it is. They would be able to know what, what uh, company it was, but they wouldn't know what machine it is. So with that in mind, um, we decided to put the numbering on the driver's side and the passenger side in the, in the back, which will be um, legible up to 50 feet away. Uh, the whip flag is still required, but the whip flag um, is kind of a request for the sand from Sand Flats Recreation Area, and um, so what we've done is we require that each ATV business operating within Sand Flats area shall install a whip flag on on each ATV in the ATV fleet, identifying it by its unique number provided by the county, legible up to fifty feet, and that makes more sense because uh, they were the people who are, who are out there in the sand flats area that are working there, they, they stated that, you know, they can't see the machines that are, that are doing illegal things, but they can, if they had a whip flag, they would know where it was and they would be able to identify that way through binoculars or something like that. Um, so this seems like the better idea because um, as a person who's had experience with whip flags, they're, they're quite costly if you want to buy a good one and they break, you might get two months out of them. So this way, uh, these whip flags were kind of staying in the sand flats area and we weren't seeing them up and down the highway when they're being towed to other places and things like that. Um, and then let's see, what else was there, Christina? I, I think, think that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I think that's pretty Josh, much it. I had a quick question on that, the, the identification. It seems like determining if it's legible from 50 feet is kind of subjective. Um, is there a reason why we didn't just say uh, you know, uh, yes. something that is 24 inches square or something like that. It comes, it's the exact language the BLM uses and all these guys already have special recreation permits with the BLM. So they've designed their logos already under the standard. So we went with it. I also heavily relied on Andrea Brand um, and her comfort level with the, these types of requirements. And, and she's used to that requirement as well because it's the BLM standard. Okay, thank you. And then Quinn could talk to the unique numbers, but he's created um, my recollection. We haven't talked about it in a while, but my recollection is Quinn created a system where there'd be a three letter combination based on the name of the company. And then each ATV would, you know, one through 10 or however many they have. Is that correct, Quinn? Like, I think it was two letters. Company. Two letters, wasn't it? Okay. I thought we ended up going three. It's up to you. <laughs> I'd have to look back at it. I would have said it was two, but yeah, I and mean, it was just it ended up being like a combination of the company name. Like I don't know. Yeah. It was it was a simple process. I think Janet had the letters. 
Okay, and then we need to do a good job of getting that information, the unique number to each ATV company, um, which I understand we're going to do at the point we're um, issuing licenses. Or Quinn, do you have any yeah. update on how that's going to work? I I don't I don't know that we've actually fleshed that out yet. I believe that uh, when the business licenses were sent to the county, when the, when the applications were sent to the county-owned um, ATV companies that their special identifier and identifying number had already been assigned to them. Yes, I definitely remember assigning them. Great, they've already been assigned, perfect. Okay, any more questions on that chunk of the update? And then we'll move to reporting next and Kevin can talk to that. Okay, Kevin. It's okay. Um, yeah, be, before getting into the nitty gritty, I just wanted you know, to take another step back because I, I think there's maybe four different things going on with this Title V revision and what they have in common is they all land in Title V. Um, but I, you know, I think one of them, the one that Josh has talked about is fine tuning the enforcement of some you know, UTV noise ordinance type things that were already on the books. Um, and then there's, the, what Christina mentioned, you know, the tax compliance for overnight accommodations, and then there's tax compliance for vehicle rental companies. And then the final, the fourth piece, which I was going to talk a little bit about, is um, just re reporting for the sake of, you know, the county kind of understanding what's going on within our borders to help us, you know, make better policy going forward. And in particular, um, report, you know, overnight accommodations, giving occupancy reports. Um, one, so this, this first came up, um, you know, Elaine Gisler over the past few years before she left, you know, took the initiative to get a, a lot of, I think, really good data sources for us. And one of them was, um, information that comes from STR or STAR, which, um, you know, kind of does occupancy for larger hotels. And one thing that stood out to me looking at those numbers is that, it only covered maybe 70 or 80% of hotels in Grand County. And it wasn't a random 70 or 80%. It was basically the high end. And that the, um, you know, the, the more budget hotels, the ones that were lower priced, they weren't participating, you know, which you know, probably made sense from their, that point of view. And so I think the genesis of this idea is that, you know, we can, you know, it shouldn't be that hard for us to get a more comprehensive idea of how many people are in the Valley on a given weekend. Um, and how, how that fluctuates through the week and how it fluctuates season to season. And are we up 10% from last year or is it more like 30? You know, those kinds of questions. Um, you know, the other big mis missing piece from that data is um, Airbnbs and um, RV rental spots. So, um, so that's the intention in that section. Um, and so, so maybe now to, I'll just say, I've, you know, be, I think before, before this got on the, the current agenda and, and continuing through the day, you know, I've had a lot of feedback from um, business owners, which is great because I, I think our goal is to try to get the information we need and get the enforcement we wanna do, but not make it more burdensome than necessary. And, and I think the, you know, the people who operate these businesses are exactly the people we need to hear from for how to make it as the you know, least, least burdensome as possible. Um, so, my notes here. So, so now, now I'm just gonna address some miscellaneous small items in no, in no particular order. So one idea that was given to me, and this is about something that was already on the books. Um, the, you know, I think right now we're, requiring people to post a placard reminding their tenant, you know, their customers of our noise ordinance. Um, and the question was, well, maybe that should be in the email that goes out when you get your reservation. I mean, as all of us who've rented an Airbnb know, once we place a reservation, we get this email trying to tell us everything we need to know for staying there. So I'm just passing that idea along. Um, I encourage the person who gave it to also write an email, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, this, this is another one addressing things that are already on the books, um, but they, and I think we've gotten several comments about this, 
um, not liking, yeah, I think it's a combination of B and C that Christina's displaying there. They don't like the idea that they're having, they're responsible for their customers violating noise ordinances, you know, maybe after they've left the premises and things like that. Um, so again, that, passing that along. Um, Let, let's do talk to that because they're, um, this is in both the motor vehicle section or chapter 5.02 and this chapter 5.03, through three, almost exact same language. Um, this states that three or more violations by the business or a customer of the business in any calendar year shall constitute grounds for revocation of the business license. This was passed last April, 2021. Um, obviously, we haven't moved to revocate anyone's license on this ground, nor would we um, for any, you know, uh, anything other than egregious violations, but it constitutes grounds for revocation. It's not automatic. It's not a shall uh, be the basis for a revoked license. It constitutes grounds. So it's just a tool by the county in the event of a, of a bad actor, a bad actor business. We don't have, I don't have an example of that. Um, it's a tool. It also, and, and I did specify it here, the motor vehicle already specified it was only for the section in which it's embedded. It's, it wasn't actually intended to be the entire chapter. For now, anyway, uh, it's, it doesn't apply to this tax reporting and, and tax education stuff, just FYI. It is, you know, only what comes here in 5.03.010. And then for the motor vehicle license, specifically the ATV regulations. Um, so it, it does have some limited application. It's a tool. Uh, it, there isn't a proposal in, in this to change that other than this administration administrative clarity, clarification here. Um, but certainly that's something you guys could take up if the commission wants. Okay. And then some, so another comment I got related to this was um, lack of a cure period. The idea is like, if there's some kind of violation, couldn't we just like send out a letter and give them 30 days to fix it without it being one of these three strikes against them? So. And of course we would. So thank you. That's the other point is that, um, you can't revoke, we can't revoke a license, just boom, you're done. We have to provide by law a due process process, which includes a cure period, it includes a hearing, and then it includes an appeal. So it's a lengthy process. So all this does is it constitutes grounds to begin that process. Okay, yeah, so I, I think we probably need to just make that clear. Um, and it then- is, Sorry, if I can interrupt, so, so a violation, uh, in in this sense, that would that would that would that wouldn't be just a complaint from a from a resident that lived next door to some overnight accommodation business. It would have to be a recorded violation by a law enforcement officer. Um, it would at least be a finding of violation by the county after investigation. So law enforcement, very, I mean, very likely would be involved for any violation of our noise ordinance. Um, Josh, our code compliance officer, could be involved. But again, there's a lot of due process, even in the investigation. If it meant complaint, it would say complaint. It doesn't. Three or more violations of this section. Thank you. I, I also heard from a couple of overnight accommodations owners, and um, a few of them suggested that um, it should be written in that they would receive notification of each violation um, that, that might happen with a customer of theirs. Okay. We could certainly beef up, you know, what, what the whole process looks like. So I can work on some language to that effect before the next meeting. Okay, and, and so I, I think my remaining comments are about the reporting, if you wanted to scroll down to that section. So first just to address kind of a, a, a general issue, um, well, I, I guess I guess we're asking for two types of reporting. One is just pure occupancy, like how many units are you renting? And then the other was things like average daily rate or things that had to do with money. So let, let me first just address the um, the occupancy. The, the hope was certainly that this is not a burdensome reporting requirement. It seems like the kind of thing that every business already knows. You know, you're not gonna try to rent the same room twice 
you got to keep track of you know which rooms are rented on which days. Um, and I did talk to a couple of property management people, and they said, "Oh yeah, you know, quick and easy re computer report. That that's information that's very easy to, for them to get their hands on." Um, there was a little confusion on the part of some people about whether we were asking for the number of people versus the number of units. And I I made it clear, and I think it's already clear in the ordinance that this, this is this is units. We we understand it would be very difficult to try to figure out how many people are staying in some you know, three bedroom Airbnb. So I'll say um, the number of rooms sold. I will say I, I received numerous phone calls and emails and no one had actually read the language. So okay. I, and you know, I can appreciate those kind of details. Um, yeah. If you're upset, you're not going to focus on the details, but. Yep. Though, though I, I, I think some, some of the people commenting clearly had, had read parts of this because they, they were quoting it. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad to get all this feedback and I'm glad we're able to you know, go through a few iterations before this. Um, is is passed. Um, there was an issue about monthly versus quarter. I don't or has it. Okay, now it says monthly. An earlier draft said quarterly. I, I think monthly makes a lot more sense. You know, quarterly is just encouraging people to, you know, procrastinate and put this off until it becomes actually it is become onerous because you've got like three months worth of reporting to do. Um, I think monthly makes more sense. I, I think we might even want to facilitate. You know, if people would prefer to report weekly, or you know, we can accept that as well. Um, another issue, which I, I think needs to be stretched out, is um, you know, going back to the big hotels. There's this STR organization which is already collecting you know this information and more, and so we the idea was to save people trouble. And if they're already pointing to STR, then maybe we can get the information via STR, and we we don't need to add any additional work at all. And then this, um, all the rooms was a, a sort of vaguely similar company that dealt with Airbnbs. Um, so I, I think, at least last time I was part of the conversation, we still hadn't confirmed that information given to those companies will be accessible to the county. You know, maybe, maybe if we pay a little bit of money. And so um, I, I do think we need to confirm that before this is is finalized. Um, well, we. Um, and I'm assuming August is not on the call, but if he is, please jump in. Uh, we already have subscription services to star in all the rooms. Um, and that the way they generate the info for us is um, kind of countywide. So we can't tell what is X hotel doing in reservations or what is, you know, X address Airbnb doing. All we can see are really general trends. We can't even see how many. Um, overnight accommodations are responding. It is a voluntary effort at this point. Um, so, so it is incomplete. Yeah. And again, the, the, the genesis, you know, for this, you know, fourth part that I'm talking about now, the reporting, the, um, the genesis of the idea was actually to fill in some of the gaps of what STR was already giving us. Um, and, and then some of the very big gaps are non-hotel overnight accommodations like Airbnbs or RV campgrounds. Um, the, yeah, and then, and then the, the final comment I have is, um, I think at least the last draft I looked at was also asking to report an average daily rate. Um, and I think that's perceived by business owners as a lot more intrusive and onerous. Um, I think for some of the big hotels, that's kind of considered like a trade secret. And if Josh wants to jump in here and correct, you know, this is one of his many areas of expertise. Um, but I, I think that's something that you know they might not so be be so psyched about letting us know, and, and I don't know that it's really essential for the county's purposes. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing for us to try to keep careful track of how many people are coming into the valley at different times of year. Is a different thing for us to understand how much they're paying, and um, I wonder if that's maybe just a little bit too ambitious. And 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 also if if we're if we're only after that information for tax compliant purposes. You know, we can get people's you know state tax filings um, if we jump through the right hoops. I think so. so this highlighted thing, language you're looking at um, so, so has taken the average daily rate out. Oh yeah. Just okay, great. Okay, so that, that's a change. Concern. Yeah. Oh. So the highlighted language is a change um, that moves the reporting from quarterly to monthly. It um, also says, "Hey, you can." 
report by STAR, all the rooms, or, you know, forms or online platforms provided by the clerk's office. Um, I think it's kind of the opposite of what you just said in talking with Josh and, and that hotels and motels are reporting the ADR already to STAR. That's part of what STAR collects. But it's the RV campgrounds. It's the Airbnbs that are not doing that. And I just use the same language for the motor vehicle reporting requirements. Um, and they are not reporting that to anyone right now. And I certainly got feedback that that was, as Kevin says, um, our motor vehicle businesses are saying that's both onerous and too much, too much to ask for. In addition to Star and all the rooms, which we already pay for, there's a third subscription service that we've been looking into that's a lot more expensive, where it actually mines all the prices already being paid, right? So you can go in and it, it, you know, it'll go to Airbnb and mine everything that's being paid for at what price in Grand County, et cetera, et cetera. So we can continue to spend money and get that access. Part of what we're trying to do here um, is get some help from the community to, to decrease the costs. We're all paying for it one way or the other, right? So it's a, it's a burden shift, essentially. But I have proposed language here, and it's the same, essentially the same with the motor vehicle reporting above. Um, Kevin was interested in the overnight accommodation um, reporting most. I, I believe this is accurate, Kevin. Um, I included the motor vehicle reporting since, by and large, these two sections are mirroring each other. Um, that's up for discussion. Um, we could, you know, require this type of reservation reporting of a lot more um, recreation businesses as well. So all that's on the table for the commission to discuss. This is just a proposal. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I think that's all the um, the comments that I had. I, I do lean toward maybe not, you know, asking for any price information, you know, not like, and as, as you've drafted it in the yellow highlighting, if we change our minds later, we, you know, we can always add it back in, but um, so that, that's all I have to say for now. Does the commission have any comment or any question? I think we should start do comments and discussion after we get through it all, but do you guys have any questions on that piece? Okay, then let's go on to the, um, the tax stuff. And I'll also point to Chris um, some here. Um, I have moved a new requirement into the general 5.01 that applies to all businesses. And that's the sales and use tax workshop requirement, um, which is here, it's written generally. Uh, the tax commission holds sales and use tax workshops four times a year. You can um, attend remotely or in person. They are live and engaging um, purposefully. It's three hours. It's a lot of complicated information. And so the tax commission is really committed to continuing to have a interactive process. They are building a self-paced workshop where you'll have to like answer questions every now and then. So they make sure you're really paying attention in there. Um, but they don't support just uh, uploading a, a recorded version of a three-hour workshop that they know no one's going to listen to. Um, I talked with the sales and tax use division today because I had one idea from a motor vehicle business to exempt, actually two motor vehicle businesses brought this up. It's like, hey, my accountant or my CPA files these taxes, why should I have to do a workshop? Um, I brought that up with the sales, uh, sales and use tax division, and they said, no, it's exactly the accountants and the CPAs that we want in these workshops. We want anyone doing the tax filing. And accountants and CPAs are messing it up the majority of the time because they're the majority of the filers. So they asked me, please do not exempt accountants and CPAs. We want them to uh, attend this workshop. You'll see in the struck out language was the original proposal where I was proposing a cyclical workshop requirement. Um, and talk, talking to the tax division, they don't recommend that. They think it's helpful and useful one time. They, they do encourage us to require every time the tax filer changes, whether that's an owner or agent, or whether that's a tax professional, every time that tax filer changes, they need to attend the workshop. Um, so these revisions are reflective of um, both feedback from our local businesses, but also speaking with the tax division today about that. So that applies to everyone. Um, generally, also, we've really firmed up um, some of the application requirements apply to all businesses. Some of this stuff is we're already doing, right? We just didn't have it in here. In here. 
Um, some things are new though. For example, certificate of existence, proving that your company is um, in good standing with the state. That's a free certificate you can get online. The statement of authority, now that we have affidavits, we're, we're gonna need to uh, the business to prove up their signatory authority. We will provide this form. We're allowed to rely on the form. It's not some big process or requires investigation, but just um, some of the stuff that we have already been doing. Um, I need to clean this up a little bit now that I moved the workshop above, um, but that's what's going on there. Most of the rest of the changes are in that 5.02. Um, which is the more specific chapter. So now both for motor vehicles and for overnight accommodations, um, we are proposing a sales tax affidavit be required as part of the license application or renewal. Um, I, I propose the affidavit for these two businesses because I'm personally aware of underreporting occurring in these two businesses. Chris has a, a bigger, broader um, view of uh, tax compliance than I do. So I do want to hear from him whether that's appropriate that we've limited to these, whether we should require all businesses to sign a sales tax affidavit of this type. Um, the sales taxes are complicated. The Utah Tax Commission does um, publish rate charts um, so for these two businesses, and even motor vehicles, there's distinguishment within how motor vehicles are treated. OHVs, pure car rentals, are car rentals for repairs. Like when your car is being repaired or you rent a car, those have three different tax structures just for motor vehicles, right? So, I mean, if we're requiring it of every single business and we're providing this type of specificity, which I think is a good idea because it's complicated, you know, that'll take more work, but maybe not a bad idea. Um, so what it says now is, hey, the business is, is, is just attesting that they understand they need to collect and pay the taxes. They're going to collect the tax at the rate that's in effect at the time of the sale. They're going to pay it to the state based on deadlines set up in statute. Um, they're going to pay the rate structure as set out. So for example, you know, there's a new OHV tax. That tax is 13.85% and we split out how that is achieved. Now that could, as amended by state and local law, that could change up or down through time. That's where it is right now. And it's been, you know, we have a new OHV tax, but other than that, it's been stable for a long time, years and years. Um, this subsection two, we got a, um, a, a an opinion of the Utah Tax Commission um, that the OHV tax and the sales tax on all motor vehicles, so this would apply to Jeeps too, um, that are used as part of a tour. So a you drive tour that includes a vehicle, you must pay sales tax and as to an ATV, you must pay the OHV tax on the value of the rental vehicle. If they cannot or will not separate out the value of the, of the vehicle use as part of the you drive tour, then they have to pay the tax on the entire tour cost. That is an example of underreporting that is occurring now where we have these you drive, you drive tour businesses who are um, arguing that they're exempt from sales taxes on the vehicle because the vehicle is part of a service being sold, the service being the guiding. But that is not true. Um, so there's this new um, uh, requirement that they attest that they understand that they have to pay taxes on the value of the vehicle used in that tour. Um, it's attesting that, hey, we're providing this information for your convenience only and businesses are required to know the law. Um, and that, and this is already set up, of course, in the Utah sales and use tax, but there are civil and criminal penalties for failing to comply with tax law. Um, so that, what I just went through was the, the ATB sales tax affidavit. The motor vehicle one is set up exactly the same. It's, it's um, tax structure is set up though between the standard vehicles, uh, rentals, or a rental because of a car repair. And then the OHV, uh, sorry, the overnight accommodation sales tax affidavit is set up the same. And then it splits out the TRT tax. It has one additional provision that the um, it's the business owner's responsibility to ensure that Airbnb or VRBO or their property manager, whoever it is, is paying the TRT tax to the location where the property is located. What has happened is um, some of these companies like Airbnb are sending the TRT taxes to the jurisdiction where the business is headquartered. 
The Utah State Tax Commission, I also got an update on this today, has done a massive amount of work to go through every single Airbnb or VRBO account in the whole state of Utah to fix this problem. Um, and Grand County is, it wasn't one of the problem children, so that's good news. Kane and Garfield were the top two for this confused issue. It was it was a result of both some licensing issues at the county level, but also Airbnb software and process. It has now gotten fixed, um, but you know I, I included that acknowledgement on the um, overnight accommodation one. Chris, do you want to add anything? Um, you know, I will say I've gotten a lot of comments saying I do the right thing, I pay my taxes, I hire an accountant. Um, and of course, there are tons of businesses that are paying the right taxes. Um, there are a ton of businesses who are confused, and the, and the point of this is to support them. And they might not be paying the right taxes, but it's not because they don't intend to. Um, they need more education support, and we hope this will um, help them. And, and then, of course, there, there's a percentage that we do believe are underreporting on purpose, and we hope to capture those, those folks, too. Chris. Okay. So... Um, in the last couple of years, you know, I've gotten quite a few uh, suggestions and, and some complaints that some businesses haven't been pay, you know, paying the TRCC taxes, which would be restaurant and car rental taxes, and now uh, also the OHV tax that just went into effect in the uh, beginning of this year. And just through the course of, you know, evaluating um, the tax information we get from the tax commission, you know, it became uh, fairly apparent to me that businesses weren't um, reporting the correct taxes. Now, I'm not going to say that they're not collecting the right total percentage of tax, but I can see very easily in these reports that they're not remitting that tax or reporting that tax accurately, uh, which is to say, you know, there's four generally applicable sales taxes that are applied to every single transaction except for food ingredients. And so if you look at a, a business and they're not reporting all four of those taxes, then you know that they're not submitting or remitting their taxes properly. And so, you know, is it because they're not collecting it? I don't know. I have no idea. It, it could be that they're collecting it, but when they file their reports, they're just putting the money in the wrong category. And that actually has significant implications for us because, um, each tax is split out differently between the city, the county, and the state. And then each tax also has a different set of restrictions that go with it. And so, you know, there's a lot of rules that we have to comply with with regard to how we uh, expend sales tax money. And so if, if people are remitting their sales taxes with inaccurate reports, you know, that could mean that the splits that are going to the state, the county, and the city are wrong. And it could also mean, you know, that the restrictions on that money uh, are wrong. And so, um, there, you know, but I, I saw it as really widespread that, that transcended every single business type. And so, you know, I'm surmising that it really must kind of come down in a lot of ways to the, to the accountants, you know. And so I do think, you know, that we need to touch base with them. Um, we, you know, we have access to the state tax commission's monthly remits, and so we don't actually need any businesses to um, provide us with their tax returns. We already can see what they're paying. Um, you know, I think the affidavit, you know, just have, having them sign an affidavit, um, you know, expressing that, yes, I understand the tax structure for my particular business and the type of transactions that I do, you know, is a good idea because it's complicated. And I would say if we we're going to do that in this ordinance, that we should actually break out every single individual tax that they need to pay. Because, again, it's not the total amount of taxes uh, that's prob probably the, the issue here. I'll bet most businesses are collecting the correct total. It's just that when they're reporting it to the state, they're probably not categorizing it properly. And so if we, you know, provided that information to them and made it easier for them, you know, the accountants or the, or the businesses that are filing their own taxes, you know, to categorize those, those remits, it would probably help a lot. But I don't think we need to request, you know, monthly or quarterly tax returns or anything like that. We already have that information. And, you know, I, I suspect that most of the problem is just more in the reporting side of things than the collecting side of things. 
but I don't really know. I mean, we do have a, an agenda item later, you know, that's um, for the purposes of uh, providing some information to an analyst, you know, to look for sales tax leakage. And, you know, we may have some of that, and there may be some people that are, in, you know, not collecting the taxes, and that's why they're not being remitted. But at this point, I just, you know, I can't say one way or the other. But I can say there's something significantly wrong, and it's wrong across the board. Okay, so then I will move the sales tax affidavit into the general section and work harder on um, splitting out all the various taxes for the next version. Okay, that's our presentation, guys. Discussion. Um, I think, you know, I would like to get some feedback for the next version, um, but I do support a motion to table for now. Obviously, I think we have some work to do. Um, but I think if, if there's anything like that you guys find super objectionable or that you really do like and, and think we need or, or whatever, I think any feedback I can get for what I bring back would be helpful. I'd, uh, I'd start by moving to table agenda item J, repealing Title V, business licenses of the Grand County general ordinances and related ordinances, um, number 632, and adopting new Title V business licenses. Um, I just, just wanted to interject maybe a point of procedure or something like that. Um, you know, if we're being really strict about Robert's rules, I think once we table it, we're not supposed to talk about it anymore because, you know, it's not on the floor. So it might be better if we did that at the very end. I, and, or we could just be looser with the rules, which is fine by me. So. Do you mean, Kevin, um, a motion in a second? I mean, we wouldn't vote on it, right? We would just motion second and then discuss? Um, I think motions at table you're not supposed to have discussion on. So is it immediately oh. vote. But, but again, so I'm- just to, just to clarify one more procedural step, tabling is the motion you make when you want to uh, readdress the agenda item later in the meeting. Postponement is when you want to address it in a different meeting. And so um, the correct motion in this in instance would be to postpone, not to table. Um, but, you know, it, it, Robert's Rules does sort of dissuade, you know, discussion about postponement and tabling. But, you know, if you want to discuss it, I don't think it's the end of the world. <laughs> So, I, but I, I prefer, motion would, I prefer, Oh yeah, sorry. I prefer to open discussion first, and then we'll get that motion going. That and then, I also wanted to bring up Gabe that um, uh, I've gotten some comments from people that would like to speak to this issue, and we did go past the 6 p.m. citizens to be heard. I don't know if you want to give people a chance to um, speak on this before you wrap it up or what. But I just wanted to point that out that. Um, we went past the citizens to be heard, Mark, and there are some people I think that would like to address this subject. I'd like to say that since we're so far past six, um, I I would actually like to just introduce um, that some some public comment right now. Then the commission can speak, um, and then we can move forward from there. Um, so with that being said, um, if there's anyone, uh, if there are um, citizens to be heard, I do sincerely apologize that we've gone so far over um, our 6 p.m. marker for that period. Um, but if there, were to, if there was anyone that would like to speak at this time, um, please unmute, state your name, and um, please uh, uh, keep your comments to two minutes, please. Are there any citizens to be heard? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Nina Barbo? Oh, sorry. It's Steph, somebody who's got the title Steph. Go ahead. Uh, uh, did you just call on Nina Barlow? I'll let her talk first. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That yeah, was ahead, one Nina. of the chats. So, yeah, go ahead, Nina. Let me, okay. I'm unmuting here. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm confused. I thought the meeting was starting at six, so I kind of felt like I was coming in in the middle here. But I guess my first question is, you know, what is the big picture here? What is really the overall objective of all of these changes? It appears that, it, it you know, just with listening and reading through here, that there's a few businesses not paying their taxes in the in the manner um, which you know, that, that they're intended. Um, and so it appears that 
basically we're going through a quarter, we're going to all go through a quarterly audit. I mean, it seems like an excessive and invasive process and costly process that you're asking all of us to endeavor. I mean, if there's a few who aren't, why aren't those individual businesses just being audited? Did you get that? <laughs> Right. So I, I'll just ask you to sort of present a comment and then we'll kind of move through the, any of the public that needs to make comments. Um, and if there are any direct responses, um, the commission or staff or, or our attorney will, will address those. Uh, we'll make note of any questions that might be able to be answered um, in this meeting. So did you have any other uh, comments, Mrs. Barlow? Besides posing that question? You're muted, Nina, if you're talking, we can't hear you. <laughs> is that um, if you can't answer the basic question that, you know, what, what is the overall objective of these changes? Um, if that can't be answered, then there's no point in asking detailed questions at this point. So, so I do encourage you to, to, to write, um, if you, you know, if you have a series of more detailed questions, um, please address those questions via email as we continue to work through this. Uh, this process, um, and we'll try our best to address that, the, the more basics that you just um, posed. But what I guess what I'm just trying to say is that, that, that we're not really having kind of a back and forth. This is just a, a citizens to be heard public comment session um, section at this moment. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. All right. Um, are there any other members of the public that um, like to speak at this time? Scott McFarland, go right ahead. Hi there. Hi there, guys. You get Lori McFarland today. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. I'd like the public record to show that scheduling the complete repeal and replacement of an entire section of code, in this case, section five, without a public hearing is denying due process to a large class of businesses in this community. You wrote bad ordinances and made hard deadlines without providing a pathway for compliance. You've willfully impeded the commerce of a large class of Grand County businesses and clearly caused damage to my business. We've made massive financial and staffing investments to comply with your ever-changing rules and deadlines. Outfitting operations, especially during a pandemic, are like a huge sailing ship. They need a lot of sea to make the turn. Our new fleets had to be ordered months in advance to meet your January 31st deadline, only to learn that the county was not prepared to meet their own deadline. Now that sailing ship May, must turn again. Our town, our, our tours cross through city and county um, streets and roads. Title V addresses nightly rentals, motor vehicle rentals, and side-by-side -side outfitter businesses, all of which have become businesses that Grand County Commissioners clearly love to dislike. Let's practice some mutual tolerance and coexist both in town and on the trails and at city market. We need to postpone this hurry up, fix it up effort of a band-aid, fix it up quick, lack of due process and enact better legislation and implement it effectively in 2023. You're not ready. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, are there any other citizens to be heard at this time? Uh, this is Dave Hellman. I didn't know how to raise my hand on this thing. I'm on my wife's computer, so it says Steph. Thanks, um, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm also a, a citizen that is involved in the side-by-side -side world and businesses and stuff. And um, I've 
just anyways, trying to get ready to talk to her and all this stuff. I have a hard time with this kind of understanding all the legalities and whatnot. And uh, Lori McFarland really said what I think a lot of us business owners are feeling. And I'm glad that she spoke. She's very well spoken. And um, I agree with her that you guys, I know you said in the beginning of this meeting that you guys kind of blamed it on the flipping of the fleet. I haven't sold one of my vehicles. They're all 2021. Um, they're, they're all two years old so they're all 2020s and 2021s and so i still have a fairly new fleet i only i do not do rentals so my machines don't get beat up we only do guided tours i think that the the numbers on the sides of the machines is a target on our back we are following the blm rules we have our business names on three sides of the vehicles that can be seen from 50 feet away i feel that it is putting a target on our backs um these guys that come into town with their super loud music and their speakers playing and their aftermarket exhaust are they going to be pulled over constantly and sound tested or are you guys just going to continuously go after the tour companies and i guarantee you and i know for a fact that every single tour company in town runs oem factory stock exhaust nobody modifies their exhaust because we are all trying to we're trying to be as quiet as possible i personally use a fleet they're all the exact same machine and they are the one of the quietest machines on the market and this i feel like we're being targeted and the stress that you guys have put on me and my family has caused problems with me and my family and my business to the point that i don't know what i'm going to do and um just i i don't even i'm stressed out of my mind it's the end of the sea oh it's the beginning of the season and we're trying to prepare for this and we're not ready we're supposed to open our doors in two weeks and i don't have a business license and not only that i have another federal permit that is under the same business license so if i start operating under this federal bit of this federal contract without a valid business license am i later on going to be held accountable for that or do i are you guys going to pay me the x amount of dollars a month i'm out until you guys give me an actual business license i'm curious so i guess i know that's a question but i'm just i don't know that's uh i guess i'm probably at about two minutes so um i just i feel like we're being targeted 100 percent, and i know there's going to be some repercussion to this that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your comment, Dave. Um, any other citizens to be heard that'd like to speak at this time? Yes, Mark Moore. Okay, Mark, go right ahead. Yeah, Lori, uh, she nailed it exactly. Said I couldn't have said it better myself. I'm not gonna say what I said. She said it good enough. But to Christina on the sales tax, um, I was audited this year still just finishing my sales tax audit up and my auditor is 25 year with the state and she set we went through and adjusted some sales tax rental vehicles are 18.35 percent total the tour company from the state from my auditor two weeks ago we agreed she set it at 8.35 percent she did not require me or there was nowhere that was said from my auditor, who's been there for 25 years, she did not say that the tours had to have the rental tax on them. So that's how we just set up my whole system. We're already booking into the future. People are already paying. So that there's some discrepancies that we need to get done. But as like Dave said, are we being targeted? Yes, we know we're being targeted. And um, when are we gonna get notice to where the testing is, I need to know because I just had a full knee replacement. So I got to bring in employees that are still laid off to get the vehicles delivered there. I mean, I'm, I'm not in the, I'm, I'm at home right now using a walker. So I need to know when I, I got to get this set up. When are we going to get noticed when the machines are going to be tested? When the, when I haven't heard it, got an email said the sheriff's department has time to test the vehicles. When is all this going to be forwarded to us, the business owners? All right, um, thank you for your comments, Mr. Moore. Um, I see uh, Lacey Shumway with her hand up. Hi, Lacey, uh, please state your name and limit your comment to two minutes, please. Thank you. 
Sounds good. This is Lacey Shumway, um, and I am the director for the Chamber of Commerce, and I just wanted to throw out there, first of all, thanks for the communication that we've had um, just today since the came we've made some calls, and I just want to thank you for, um, it sounds like, leaning towards tabling this until more discussions can be had, um, and then just inviting you guys to maybe take part of, we can have a chamber chat about this um coming up just as soon as possible if we can maybe schedule that with you guys um and just let the businesses and the public know that um that we hope to provide a forum to maybe give some input and feedback and then i guess just hope that you'll listen to that feedback as well thank you thank you very much for your comments uh, I have someone um, on the on Zoom here as Moab Cowboy. Please state your name and limit your comments to two minutes, please. Thank you. Hi, this is Beverly. Um, I am with Moab Cowboy. And I'm just wondering, since there are so many issues that are not resolved, and as business owners, we can't follow the rules that you all are wanting, what are the ramifications whenever our season starts if we continue to do business? Thank you for your comments. Um, I see, uh, I believe that's Mark Hor Horowitz. Um, Mark, um, go ahead and offer comments. Please limit your comments to two minutes. Are you there, Mark? All right, we'll just, uh, maybe we'll pass over you momentarily. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Um, raise your hand on Zoom or, or unmute. I have someone on here uh, that's BRC office. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, my name is Ben Burr. I'm with Blue Ribbon Coalition. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that does advocate on behalf of increased recreation access. Many of the um, business owners on this call and their customers or members of our organization. And I've reviewed a few things in this ordinance, proposed ordinance. Uh, the first question I have is the background information does say that the compliance testing should be completed by the end of June each year, which isn't consistent with what was proposed in the ordinance to have it be done by the end of February. And so it's not clear to me why on one part of the document, June was an acceptable date and February was what was included. And so it'd be nice if that was clarified. Um, I also have concerns with the changed definition. Um, there's the definitions section seems to be haphazardly put together. You have multiple items of like G and H. I don't know why there's duplications there, but it's the second G item where you're defining engaging in business or carrying on business means and includes, but is not limited to marketing to, or having contacts with the public in Grant County. Um, that just seems like a very broad definition to include marketing. It uh, seems like that's a restriction of freedom of speech to tell a business that they can't market to someone in Grant County without a business license. Um, it just seems odd to me. And so that if you're if this is a, a a choose your own adventure, I think we should choose a different adventure besides what's being proposed there. Um, and overall, I just echo the concerns that were raised by several of the other business owners that have joined this call. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? I'm very fine. Very, you hear me all right? I'm very fine. Thank you. And then I'm sorry I was a little scattered there. No problem. You're you you it's you have the mic. Oh, it looks like we lost him again. Oh. Kevin, did you have something to say? I, I was just gonna let Mark know that we couldn't hear him. That's all. I'm sorry, are we okay. back now? Am I you're here? back now. Hi, uh, yep, you're back. I'm I'm sorry, I switched screens in order to read the, um, the uh, agenda, the Title V. Um, 
you know, I've, I've been uh, renting my Airbnb, my uh, bed and breakfast only through Airbnb for six years now. I'm just starting my sixth year without one single problem. And uh, I want to say they collect and they submit uh, all 14.4% of the taxes. So I would be curious to know why I should be obligated to collect and submit those taxes when my provider already does that for me. So that that's all I want to say is uh, if you're if you're uh, an overnight rental in this county and you're renting through Airbnb, it's my understanding that they collect and they submit all the taxes as they do in my case. So I just I just don't want to be forced into um, collecting that information or or collecting that money. There's no way I can collect that money from my from my guests. Airbnb already does it. So I just wanted to make good luck to us all. Thank you very much for your comment. Anyone else uh, here that would like to make comments? Please raise your hand or unmute. Um, Chair, okay. if there's no more comments, I would like to address, I think all of those comments or questions posed within comments. Yeah, I wanted to just thank everyone for the comments and and uh, just uh, apologize again for the delayed nature of our six o'clock citizens to be heard. And I appreciate everyone's patience and hanging on the line uh, to give those comments. Go right ahead, Christina. Okay, uh, hopefully I won't miss any, I was, I was taking notes. Um, in order of what I think is the priority, um, in, in terms of the issue with a gap in licensing, we sent, the clerk's office sent an email to all of our businesses at, at the email addresses they've provided to us, letting them know there's going to be a 30-day delay. Um, that 30-day delay, my understanding was at the request of the ATV businesses. I'm certain, we've certainly heard from a couple that that was not their preference. Um, we were committed, you know, in terms of the Blue Ribbon Coalition comments about June, the current version doesn't have June in it. Sounds like you're looking at a couple of drafts ago. Um, but, you know, the in discussing this with some of our other electeds with the Planning Commission that also vetted this draft at the last, um, their last public meetings, this is the second public meeting on it, um, that there was a commitment that we need to get this testing done before the start of the season. Um, so the clerk's office sent an email that said, hey, your, your business license is extended. To the extent you need a, a formal business license, we will issue you a temporary business license. ASAP just ask, because I can appreciate the, the comment that you know insurance requirements, et cetera, might need a temporary business license. My understanding is we only got taken up on that by one person. If anyone who's listening needs a temporary business license through the end of February, we have offered that, continue to offer that, and we can issue that right away. So contact the clerk's office, Jana Kyle in particular. In terms of the testing dates, I only just got um, the confirmation from the sheriff at about 4.02 today that the testing dates are going to be Wednesday uh, from 1 to 4 on February 9th and Wednesday from 1 to 4 on February 16th at uh, Old Spanish Trail Arena. I need to also wrap back with Angie. Um, and so we'll be sending out that notice to our ATV businesses tomorrow. That's the city and the county. Josh Green will be coordinating time slots for the testing for each business. If those time slots don't work for folks, then we will arrange with those guys um, to, to set up their own special testing. We did test the McFarlands with Hummer did ask us to come test. Um, around the Christmas time and one of our deputies did go out there so they could get a sense of, of what their fleet was looking like. Um, we have had another ATV uh, business owner who's very concerned about whether his fleet based on the models he has is going to pass. I, I offered several times that we could send a deputy out there to do some real initial testing. He didn't take us up on that. So I, I do feel like we have been uh, to the extent we have capacity offering and, um, you know, letting people know that, that we're going to make that work. So we will be sending official communication about the testing tomorrow. Um, as to the very first question we got about the purpose, I do think that was well discussed. Um, there is a little bit, because these updates are coming together, there's a bit of conflating between the reporting requirements and the tax requirements, and they're really quite different things. Um, as Kevin discussed, the reporting requirements are um, an effort to study our tourism trends, 
weekday rentals and reservations and occupancy versus weekends, seasons, that type of stuff. Um, and then the tax reporting, of course, is to um, get everyone on the same page about tax requirements. In terms of the tax rates that I have in the ordinance, um, I discuss those um, generally with the Utah Tax Commission today. And I also, especially if we're going to expand that to include the different um, uh, businesses, I will send um, the rates that I have split out. Um, Mark mentioned that he was told differently about the um, whether or not we assess the, the, the taxes due on the vehicle used in his tour. Uh, we do have a written tax commission opinion on that. Um, but again, that's something that I'll ask the Utah Tax Commission um, to respond to and, and possibly you know, refine the language we have in our ordinance. So I'll report back that, on that on the next one. Um, the definition, by the way, for um, Blue Ribbon Coalition, um, the, that definition is based on the definition um, for whether or not you have to be incorporated as a business in the state of Utah. Um, I will go back and make sure that marketing is the direct word, but you have to have necessary contacts with the public to be required to register or incorporate as a business, that language, but I will go back and double check it. That's a whole different issue than what we're addressing today. Um, and so I appreciate you pointing out that change definition. What's happening there is we've had numerous special events that start in Colorado and that's where fees are collected, but end in Grand County. And we are trying to set up a clear expectation for who needs a business license. Um, and uh, the point is whether the contact and the fees are collected in Grand County or not. Um, that's the intent of that business definition revision. Um, Mark Horowitz's comment about the Airbnb. No, Mark is not required to duplicate file any taxes. The definition of a business includes all the agents and, um, and professionals that are engaged by the business. Airbnb does pay your taxes. Airbnb um, satisfies the tax filing requirement. And the workshop is only required by the tax filer. Um, you know, are we gonna have to work through that where Airbnb is your tax filer? We're gonna have to work through that. Um, that's a question I'll pose to the Utah Tax Commission. I think, that's, I think that answers all the questions. So now <clears throat> what would be helpful for me is to get some feedback from the commission about what they'd like to see come back to them. Members of the commission. I, I don't know how feasible it is, Christina, to engage with um, business owners, but I, I think that there might be quite a bit of value in that. And if it's a chamber chat, whatever, um, just to get some feedback from stakeholders. And I know that I know that's a lot of work, but I'm kind of throwing that out at you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do that. We did a series of them, you know, when we passed uh, our original big Title V update in the noise ordinance. Um, the chamber is a great facilitator for doing that. Um, what I'd like to see, though, is some feedback from the commission so that I have a draft that I'm taking to that and talking to that I think the commission is supportive of. And obviously, um, you know, I would want some support there from my commission and Josh and some other folks. So we'll need to, to um, organize that. I'm happy to do it. Um, but I would like some additional feedback from the commission about what they'd like to see in this draft to discuss at that meeting. And maybe it's not substantially different than what you it's, see here. Um, yeah, I think too. one of the things that I was seeing was just some kind of minor wordsmithing. I think that to your point that uh, uh, the responsibility of the trainings will fall on the tax filer and not necessarily the business themselves. I think that that wasn't clear. I think that there's a lot of, uh, you know, guys like Dave that are actually out driving the trails and they started a business because they like being out there and, and showing people the special place. Um, it's feeling like there's a lot. And so if there's the ability to punt a lot of these um, refinements onto 
a tax filer or one of the, you know, at least, so maybe in reaching out to the businesses, expanding that to reaching out to local accountants, CPAs, and that sort to kind of uh, help fill them in on, on some of the goals here and uh, standards that are coming along. Besides some of that, that wordsmithing and kind of uh, refining, I think that, you know, and getting it off the ground with the extended testing dates, and, and I'm glad to hear that we actually have a date on the calendar now. Um, I think that for me, uh, it's looking like it's a, a good direction. And um, I think that the having more data points will be reassuring for a lot of the public too. Um, you know, what it's all kind of been anecdotal that folks are running the same kind of machines, that there's not aftermarket uh, stuff. And so it'll be reassuring to us to just kind of as representatives of the citizens to just know like, yes, here's what's going on out there. These guys aren't running aftermarket parts. These guys are, this is how big the fleet is. This is how many folks are actually taken off because we're, we, we get lots of mixed messages about rental rates, tour rates, uh, uh, short-term rental rates, all that sort of stuff. And so the effort here is to really try to clear that up. And I think that, that having that data will, will work both ways. So I think uh, we're on the right track here with um, the drafts that are before us. Um, I'll, I'll go next. I, I think, as I said before, I, I think the, the most recent draft of the reporting section looks pretty good to me. It feels like that's on, on the right track. Um, I, I do think we should maybe think about, and you know, the, the sections where businesses are liable for transgressions their customers might make. Um, I would you know, want to think that through so that it, you know, it seems fair and reasonable and is also legally defensible. Um, and, and then if the ordinance is, you know, if it's possible for someone to read the ordinance and misinterpret what's being done there, you know, maybe fix that up too. Um, and yeah, I, I, th I think the stuff on re reporting for, you know, just because the person running the business isn't necessarily the person who's filing the taxes. Um, yeah, we need, we need to be careful about that. I, I mean, I don't know if all, many of us, you know, I, it happens to me because I'm at a large company and I have to, you know, I go through a lot of trainings about how to not to bribe, you know, foreign governments or something like that, which is, you know, nothing I would ever have the opportunity to do, but it's, because some people, you know, the company do it, you know, I have to listen to a bunch of videos about that. And so if we can avoid making people sit through a some kind of tax information that's irrelevant to them, um, that would be great. And it, and it sounds like we're close to achieving that. So those are my comments. Um, my, uh, I have a comment just about the, the reporting of the rental reservation reservations for both motor vehicles and overnight accommodations that we did receive some public comments with regards to that not being so easy. And I, I think that there's, I think maybe Kevin suggested previously that, you know, that was, that he reached out to some, some of those types of business owners for overnight accommodations. And that was just an easy report. And I would kind of, that would be my assumption that that wouldn't be too hard of a report to dig up. Um, but if I'm receiving public comment that is, you know, that isn't confused about what we're actually asking for, um, and, and, and is really saying that that is, you know, very onerous, um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned by that in terms of just having uh, full confidence that, that, you know, that's not just, um, that's not really uh, too burdensome. Um, are there, if there's not a way that we can do that that isn't as isn't as burdensome on the on the businesses. Um, that was one concern that I had in terms of just making that being something that could be simply just uh, dialing up a report on a spreadsheet. Um, you know, w which with whatever system these businesses might be using or are familiar with. Yeah, and just addressing that, Gabe, I, I did talk to a few different people. Most of the feedback I got was, yeah, that that's easy to do. I, again, just talking about number of rooms or spots or whatever that are, that are being rented. Um, the one I did get some feedback saying that they thought it was really difficult until they until it was explained to them that we're not asking how many people 
you know, we are, we're just asking how, how many rooms are, are, are equivalent. And so there, there might be some confusion out there about, you know, I, I, and then, and then separately from that, there was, you know, er, earlier drafts of this were asking for price information and averages. And, you know, if you're a big operation, things can be rented at lots of different prices. And I can see how that would be onerous, but I'm, I'm also in favor maybe of, of not asking for that information. Also, my understanding that overnight accommodations are more used to providing this information. I do expect that that you know all all companies that are selling reservations um, or selling rentals are tracking this information in a format um, that could be shared. Um, but I mean, it's up for discussion. What you see here is motor vehicle reservations being reported and overnight accommodations reservations being reported. Um, and it's up for discussion if, if that's an appropriate scope, if we want to expand it, if we want to only require occupancy reporting from overnight accommodations, I'd like to hear from the commission on that. I, uh, on a similar vein of, of you know, pe people are running booking software or whatever, uh, it might be worth looking at the annual reports that are due from some of these uh, operations for the BLM. I think that to your point earlier of, of signage kind of matching standards that were already in place, I think if they're generating a, a report monthly or annually to the BLM about, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with what rental reports look like, but most outfitters are saying how many trips they're running, how many people were on each trip what they charge for the trip. And I think as much as we could mirror that kind of report, so it's just like a copy and paste, um, the easier it'd be for folks to get out and do what they really got into this business for. That's a good point. I'll look into um, what that looks like for the BLM. We haven't heard from uh, Sarah or Jacques on this item. Did y'all have anything to, any guidance here to offer? Yeah, I, I like what Evan said about the, the BLM reporting. I do that. I run a, a business where we report mountain bike tours, and we have to do that with the land management agencies. We do it yearly, um, which might make a little bit more difficult, but it is something that we keep track of, and it, it's an easy uh, model to follow. Um, I also have an um, issue with the, the three strikes language I would like to see amended uh, for the overnight accommodations concerning the um, uh, if, if their clients get um, uh, violations. Uh, I've heard from quite a few people about that and that seems a little bit uh, vigorous to me. I'm supportive of um, what's happening here and I look forward to the next draft. I have no specific changes I would like to see. Um, just one final thing I'd, I'd like to throw out there. It, um, I guess it's a variation on something other people have discussed, but you know, maybe some, you know, I, I think you know, participating in some, setting up another big meeting might be more work than necessary, but I think at minimum we could circulate a draft to the Chamber of Commerce and other people who have shown interest in this issue just to get one additional round of feedback before this um, you know, comes on the agenda. And I, and I think if we do it that way, it, it's not a, a big burden on the attorney's office. So. Maybe even a, work, a workshop before a meeting or something. Well, I, I guess I was looking for things that were easier than workshops. But, oh, right, okay. Yeah. Sometimes coordinating, well, yeah. I mean, the, the nice thing about circulating is, you know, it can be done asynchronously. So not everybody has to be able to make one particular time to give feedback. I, I can just, people can see the draft, they email us comments, and then, you know, that's, we take them into account before we stick it in the packet. Two yeah, weeks take, taking Lacey up on the chamber chat offer is great. I attended many of those last year and, um, and she does a great job with those and the chamber does a great job of coordinating with, with everybody. All right, any additional comments um, that you had, Christina? No, no more. 
Okay, well, I would entertain a motion uh, to postpone this item. I, I move that we postpone this item until the next meeting. I'll second Kevin's motion. Uh, right. Uh, we've got a motion by Commissioner Walker to postpone, seconded by Commissioner Hadler. Call for a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Vote passes unanimously. All right. We'll move on to item K, and that's approving the support of and opposition to certain state legislative bills introduced in the 2022 general sessions. Christina Sloan. Okay, um, I kind of kept going and going and a lot of course has happened since our agenda package, but I haven't updated this yet. Um, so this is an ongoing process and will be um, through the general session. Of course, the general session open third week in January. Um, and it's fast and furious like always. I do think so far, knock on wood, there are less really bad bills than last year. So that's exciting. Um, there still are some early bills of concern um, and there's some also really great bills um, to talk through. So I have proposed um, opposing and supporting um, certain bills and I'm gonna focus on those in my agenda summary. So the bills, um, let's actually go with the bills to support first. And these are House Bills 72 and 147, Senate Bills 110 and 126. Um, House Bill 70, and the point of the, um, the, the point of the action item, just for our new commissioners, is that because things move so quickly, sometimes we might need a letter of support to go out quickly. Um, if something happens, a substitute all of a sudden, or we're worried about a bill we like not making it through, some sort of hearing. Sometimes we need staff or an elected or myself to be able to testify at a committee hearing, and we want to be able to say the Grand County Commission has this position. So that's why we're asking for opposition and support. I know some of you follow the legislative session um, yourselves, and so feel free anytime one of these comes that you add one of your own bills you're looking at um, in support or opposition. Um, that is the, the big picture idea. So House Bill 72. Um, if I Christina, run, be, be, before you get started, I, I just wonder, um, given the length of our agenda, would it make sense to just hit the most, you know, just assume that we've read your very thorough summary and just cover the ones that people have questions about or that you think are most important? Um, I can try to do that. I can try to do the ones I think the public will be most interested in. Okay. Um, and one of those is this first one, HB 72, noise pollution amendments. Um, and this is, this is going to require all vehicles subject to emissions inspections, which, which is essentially all vehicles in the big urban counties, um, have to be inspected for compliance for noise suppression equipment at the time of the emissions inspection and a certification has to be as a condition of registration. So state law already prohibits modification of noise suppression equipment, but until this time, there's been no inspection, or at least there's been no inspection process for a long time in the state of Utah. So this is a bill that requires that inspection. So that's exciting. As far as I've heard, this has not been controversial. It does not affect um, ATV or, you know, any vehicles in, in Grand County because we're not subject to emissions, but it does affect, um, vehicles up in the urban counties that are traveling down here. Um, let's see, I'm trying to focus on support first in terms of um, local interest. There's a number of water conservation and water planning bills. One of those is SB 110, which is one of the bills I'm asking you to support. Um, there continues to be, you might remember last year, there was a lot of law enforcement oriented bills in the um, interests of the Black Lives Movement and police reform. You continue to see these bills. A lot of them are bills that came up last year that needed more work that didn't quite pass. One of these I think will pass um, that I'm asking for support is SB 126, Officer Intervention and Reporting Requirements. This um, codifies, it's already a requirement in case law, but officers don't learn about case law, they learn about code. And so it codifies a, an existing duty to intervene and also to report misconduct by an officer and it defines specifically what that misconduct looks like. So those are those. Um, 
Those to oppose, a big one is SB 66, and Jacques and I met with Senator Weiler this morning on that one. He's the bill sponsor. This one would open e-bikes to dirt trails everywhere. Um, the way it's written now, it conflicts with uh, land management on federal lands. It conflicts with our grant funding on federal lands. It would set up some search and rescue and emergency service nightmares. Um, it is especially designed to facilitate folks with walking disabilities to get on e-bikes on dirt trails. Um, so Salt Lake County is very concerned as well based on some conservation areas they have where they have existing agreements. So anyway, Salt Lake County and Grand County met today with Senator Weiler. He, was, he seemed really great and open to integrating um, some ex express exemptions for dirt trails on federal land that's been um, funded um, in a way that can't, uh, that non-motor or motorized uses are prohibited. Um, he actually said he might end up circling the bill for now and working on an interim as well. Um, the big one that's getting a lot of um, uh, uh, interest statewide that we should oppose is um, the HB 182 local health department amendments. That one says that all state facilities are exempt from local health department regulations and orders. What they're trying to do there, of course, is to exempt state facilities from mass mandates and other COVID related orders, but it's written so broadly that it even would um, prevent the health department from regulating uh, sewer systems or you know any health department regulation whatsoever. It's that broad. I do understand that um, you know there's a whole team of people working with Representative Wilson to narrow the application of that, but as written, um, we need to oppose that. Um, of course, the, the death penalty bill is on here as well. That was another one to um, support. So I think that those are the ones of greatest public interest, I think. I also, the League of Women Voters is very helpful. They've given us an updated list of bills of interest, but I did um, attached theirs from last week. And I, just, if I could add, um, I, I have a few that I just have flagged just with more informational, um, but there is SB 49, which is the rural film bill. And I haven't spoken with Biga about how, you know, how she views how it's going, but it's being called the Kevin Costner bill. Um, and sort of, and, and so that's a, you know, that would be expanding incentives for rural counties, uh, kind of doubling the amount of incentives I think available um, for just for, solely for rural counties. And that, you know, I think, I'm not sure where it's at right now, but I think that that would be really um, worthwhile uh, to I support. I think that one is, it's being sponsored by the sort of rural middle counties. Um, it certainly would, you know, help Grand County and um, film industry here and in, in Bega has, uh, I mean, I didn't ask her directly if she supports it, but she sure indicated she did and does expect it to increase um, film work in Grand County. Mm -hmm. And then there was just a few other ones that I, I, I'll just mention real briefly. There's House Bill 22, um, which has some new, it'll, it'll introduce some new remote meeting requirements for open and public in, in the Open and Public Meeting Act. Um, so it'll be something that I think will apply to any you know, any, any dis boards that um, meet that are still meeting virtually, um, there's going to be a requirement for roll call votes and things of that nature. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, there's HB 204, which uh, I thought was kind of interesting. It's, um, it's a requirement for CITLA to invite input from local legislators before advertising the sale of land. Um, I think it's just something that that's, that's come up um, in terms of just wanting more more interface, more more discussion um, with with CITLA before that happens, and um, I, I doubt that it's going to be very popular. I don't. I doubt that'll go very far. But I thought it was interesting that it came up anyway. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else saw that. That wasn't on my radar, so I'll ask my county attorney group what they know about it. Um, and then just one more. There's a couple more that maybe I'll just address to you, Christina. But uh, SB. Um, 111, um, it, they're, they're changing the constituency of the board of the CIV. And again, it's not something that I think that we're gonna do much about or, or wanna make a fuss about, but it's interesting to be aware that they're removing the seats for the board of water resources and, and the water quality board on the CIV and replacing them with in, industry interests. 
I did um, reach out to those water boards to ask if they had comments or concerns um, to help us decide whether to take a position. And they said they're not allowed to take a position, but that they, their boards are working with the sponsor. So I, I think there's some sort of dance going on now, but uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and that's, that's all I have uh, for now too. And thanks, Christina, for preparing all this. And, um, and I'm glad to hear that you think that, uh, you know, there aren't too many disasters happening up there. Um, actually, I have one question for you. Because um, uh, in the UAC legislative poli policy meetings, they have, a, they have a system now whereby all of the board members are logged into this sort of web based, like mobile web-based applet where, where UAC takes a position based on all, how all the board members. So basically I have the ability to, to say what Grand County thinks on any given bill so that UAC can then decide. And I feel like that come, that sort of is, that comes a little bit in contrary to this process that we have going. Um, and I, so I've, I've been kind of stepping back from participating in that too heavily thinking that, I mean, that I'm just one of seven, you know, um, so I'm not sure if, if you, you would advise that I just refrain. Um, I don't well, think I'm swaying the needle too far in one way or the other, as you might imagine with UAC, with the UAC. <laughs> I haven't made it to this year's UAC legislative meetings yet. I keep having conflicts, but I keep hoping this is the week. Um, last year, I was really impressed by their voting system. It was a little bit different because they let the members vote. Um, but it was really great to take like an initial heartbeat of where UAC members were. My personal opinion is that, that I um, hope that you will participate freely for Grand County. It's not official, you know, it's really just to create a heartbeat so that UAC knows where to, to move. So, you know, since it's not official communication, um, I personally think you should be participating um, if anyone else disagrees with me. Speak now. Great, thank you. That's great news. Yeah. Are we well, ready for a motion? Uh, yes. I guess you, I, oh, if go ahead. one of you two uh, felt comfortable speaking briefly to SB 72, the ATV weight limits, um, and kind of what that might actually mean in the real world. If This is Senator Hinkins' bill. One of the, uh, it's for class two ATVs, and one of the um, justifications is to accommodate electric ATVs, which are heavier. Um, so I, I do think it, it hasn't raised flags for me. I haven't heard anything different than what Hinkins has publicly stated. Um, so I have been hovering on it a little bit, but I haven't been concerned. Or, or, and since it's, it's not um, street legal, it's, so I'm, I don't think it really um, uh, affects the, the community debate that's always ongoing here. So Great, thanks. I, I would uh, I would entertain a motion, and um, for the person that that's making the motion, if they feel comfortable adding SB forty nine, that's that rural film bill on the on the uh, bills to support. Um, and if not, I understand as that information um, hasn't been presented in all of its breadth. Um, sure, I'll, I'll make a motion, in including that. Um, so um, I move to oppose House Bills 140, 146, and 182, and Senate Bills 66, 89, and 126, and support House Bills um, 72 and 147, and Senate Bills 49, that's the new part, 110 and 126, and authorize the chair to sign any necessary letters of opposition or support to Utah legislators deemed necessary by the county legislative committee or county attorney. Um, yeah. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you. Any further discussion? Um, but I, I guess I just wanted the people who are familiar with Senate Bill 49 to just confirm that they, you know, since most of us maybe haven't thought about that and since it wasn't in the pocket back it was confirmed that in their opinion it's a good one to support 
Chris, have you followed that, the incentives for the film industry? Let's see. Let's see, Chris, Sorry. were you oh, asking follow... me? Oh, there he is. Yeah, the, um, uh, yeah, Big has been working really hard on it. And so um, the, you know, I'm not entirely aware of all the scouting locations, but it sounds like, you know, it's in our area, San Juan County. Um, there's been some interest in <clears throat> potentially building a, a set around here somewhere too. So it's definitely economic development activity in the film realm. And so, um, you know, and the, the, these types of film incentive bills are always like this. You know, they're sort of catered to sort of what what the film industry has an interest in. And then you've got uh, people like, uh, uh, let's see, who is the guy? The uh, Kevin Garn, I believe, you know, is really championing this bill and working hard on it. And um made some recent investments in Grand County also. And so, you know, I think that if if this bill passes, you know, that we're likely to see quite a bit of film activity come our way as a result of this project. It's not all entirely in Grand County, but you know, I do believe that some of it will will occur here. So I would I would say to support it, you know, at least if you're interested in supporting uh film activity, uh large big budget film activity in Grand County. And surrounding areas. And, and so I, I just looked at the bill. It's pretty short. It looks like it, it's, it's really just taking the limits off of some tax credit. So it's not. And it's adding a definite. I think the important thing for us is it adds a definition for rural production. And that is defined to mean a state approved production in which a majority of the production occurs within a county of the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth class. Yeah, and these bills are are all about you know the uh, the tax incentives, and so um, you know I, in the past when we've had some big big budget movies in Utah, it's almost always because this legislature approves you know uh, tax incentives for these big productions, and then in the years where there aren't the incentives, um, we don't have these big budget motion pictures. And, you know, it kind of revolves around to different states, you know, who seem to take up the torch of providing a tax incentive, and then they don't do it, and then some other state takes it up. You know, it's just this revolving sort of musical chairs of who's got the best tax incentives, and there's some competition about it, um, you know, among among different states. And so, like I said, though, you know, you've got, I think you've got Kevin Garn, a pretty heavy hitter, uh, championing this, and so, you know, I think it's got a fair chance of being successful, and I would say it'd probably be beneficial to our economy. Yeah, it's being called the Kevin Cosner bill because I, in in a number of meetings, you know, that there were there were multiple commissioners that were making, you know, talking about their meetings glowingly with with Mr. Cosner because I think his some of his, he he's I think he's just. He, he um, he's sort of saying like, hey, I'll do this project if kind of situation. So I think that checks out with what you're saying, Chris, in terms of the cycles oh, yeah. and sort of well, this, yeah. as, this might as, be catering to that project. Yeah, like I say, that's the way it always is with these big motion pictures. You know, they're always going to be haggling uh, for, the, for tax incentives. Um, and so, you know, that's just the way it works. You know, I was, I was actually, you know, referencing um, Kevin Garn, the former state legislator, Right. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, as far as I know, you know, a, a good project and I don't have any, anything, uh, negative to say about it. And I know that Bigar, our film commissioner is, has been working really hard, uh, on this in particular. Great. So, Great. Any further discussion? All right. We had a motion on the uh, on the floor by Commissioner Walker, second by Commissioner Hadler. I'll call for a vote. All those voting in favor, uh, raise your hand or say aye. Vote passes unanimously. Uh, moving on to item L, approving three volunteer reappointments to the Historical Preservation Commission. All right. Yeah. At the last uh, Historical Preservation uh, Commission meeting, we um, discussed the uh, the openings and um, 
unanimous, unanimously uh, moved to recommend Josh Green, Jody Patterson, and Don Montoya to uh, continue serving there. Um, so I would uh, move to approve the reappointments of Josh Green, Jody Patterson, and Don Montoya to serve on the Historical Preservation Commission with terms expiring December 31st, 2025 for Josh Green and Jody Patterson and expiring on December 31st of 2022 for uh, Don Montoya. Thanks, Jacques. Do I have a second? Second that. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, I have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Hadler, second by Commissioner Hadeen. I'll call for, for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Vote passes unanimously. Moving on to item M, approving volunteer appointment to the Housing Authority of Southeast Utah. Um, our presenter uh, isn't present at this time. I'm not sure if that precludes us from moving forward with the motion or if there is someone who might've talked to Mary about it. I didn't, I didn't actually talk to her about this. No, but uh, I'm happy to take the torch for her. It looks like um, there was one vacancy, one application submitted. The board voted unanimously, unanimously to appoint Tatsy Guild with a term expiring 12-31-26. So because of that unanimous support and lack of other applications, I would move to approve the of Tatsy Guild to serve on the Housing Authority of Southeast Utah with a term beginning January 1st, 22 and expiring December 31st of 26. Thanks, Evan. Do I have a second? Any discussion? All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Clapper. I have a second there by Commissioner Stock. And I'll call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Vote passes unanimously. I am muted there. Um, then we got a item. We're moving on to item N, approving volunteer appointments and a reappointment to the Council on Aging. Commissioner Stock. Um, so the Council on Aging has fallen into disarray because of the COVID pandemic, basically, and and the termination of a bunch of board members' seats in combination with some vacancy. So. We have to get this board off the ground from nothing and um, thus there's no council on aging to meet in order to recommend the applicants so we're asking that the commission the county commission just um appoint these applicants without going through the council on aging since it doesn't really exist i hope that made sense anyway um I guess I could start with a motion. I move to approve the reappointment of Pat Lass serving on the county on the Council of Aging and the appointments of Sheree Major and Karen Fury, all with terms expiring 12 31 24. Thank you very much. Do I have a second? Thank you. Um, any discussion? Does the uh, Grand Center director or, or uh, can you just let me know the relationship with them and uh, Council on Aging? Yeah, they're, um, Alicia's actually on the meeting. Alicia, do you wanna speak to that? Alicia Oliver, if, if not, that's fine. Um, yeah, okay. it's, it's, sorry, oh, I'm a little cockeyed there, no problem. Um, really, we brought it up at one of the, one of the launches, kind of made a public announcement that that's what we were looking for. Um, Pat Halas was on the board before and she was one of the terms that expired during COVID and she just expressed interest on doing it again. And then Sherry, Sherry Major and Karen Ferry both um, came and, and chatted with me and we talked about what the goals were and I kind of went over the bylaws with them and then they expressed interest as well. I'm, I'm just unfamiliar with the bylaws. Do you have a seat on that board? Is that board giving you direction? Are you a voting member? It's, it's just... It, it's an advisory board for me to and for the center to make sure that all of the, what would you say, the facilities that are available to seniors and our aging community are in the community and made more aware of. Great. No, that's, that's helpful for me to understand the relationship. Thank you. 
Thanks so much for being available, Alicia. Um, yeah. And great to meet you. Great to meet you on Zoom, anyhow. Yeah. And thanks, <laughs> thanks for all the great work you're doing out, down there at the Grand Center. Thanks. All right. Any further discussion? All right. So we had a motion by Commissioner Stock and a second by Commissioner Hadeen. Um, I'll call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Vote passes unanimously. Moving on to item O, approving a memorandum of understanding with the Bureau of Land Management for Grand County to be a cooperating agency for six land use plan amendments for wild and scenic river designations. Commissioner Stock. Gabe, um, you skipped P, I think. Let's see. Oh, um, let's see. Uh, o uh, comes before P. Oh, whoops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, I see this only. I see this in the agenda. I've been communicating with the BLM. They said that they would send over an MOU, but I don't see it in the packet and I haven't received that email. So I think that we should just postpone this um, and that it's mistakenly made it into the agenda. So I would move to postpone this agenda item, but it shouldn't be controversial. It's just to continue being a part of the process. Got it. Maybe we'll get it on the next one. All right. A motion by Commissioner Stock. Oh, second awesome. by second by Commissioner Walker. For the uh, I guess we're not really discussing it for postponing it. Um, I'll call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. All right. That item will be thus postponed. Now we're ready for P approving the Grand County grant contract with the Moab Area Community Land Trust. Chris Baird, Strategic Development Director. Okay, thanks, Gabe. So if you recall, uh, last year we approved a uh, grant award for the Moab Area Community Land Trust uh, for 97700 And uh, the purpose of the grant, you know, was to um, provide the land trust with necessary administrative staff uh, to get um, a lot of the development agreements and, and projects off the ground um, prior to them establishing any significant revenue. And so this is a contribution <clears throat> that we made. Uh, typically, I, you know, for any type of financial contribution, I like to have an agreement. So we approved this last year. We did pay, I think, $6,500 last, last year for office equipment. Um, and then uh, the remainder, you know, to be paid this year. And so this is just the agreement uh, that clarifies, you know, what the grant money is for. Um, and then, you know, in addition to this, we've also previously approved um, impact fee waivers and, and development uh, review fee waivers, probably in an amount at least, you know, $40,000. And so um, just a contribution to affordable housing and helping to get the land trust moving uh, up and running quicker. And, and this is just the agreement that goes with that. I can make a motion. Please. I move to approve the Grand County grant contract with the Moab Area Community Land Trust. All right, do I have a second? I'll second that. Thanks, Jacques. Um, any discussion here? Looks good. Thanks for taking care of this, Chris. Um, I have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Stock, a second by Commissioner Hadler. And I'll call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. That vote passes unanimously. Moving on to item Q, adopting an ordinance, repealing and replacing ordinance number 413 and adopting a new section 1.05 of the Grand County General Ordinances to establish the manner in which real and personal property may be disposed of, acquired and managed. And here uh, for presenting here, we have Christina Sloan and Chris Baird. Um, I'll just uh, address sort of the technical amendments and then Chris can um, talk you through the big picture. Um, we've talked about this before. We do have an uh, ordinance in place um, that specifies the process for surplusing real property. Um, it's dated 2005. So this is really a technical amendment to update our ordinance to be consistent with state code 
also with current county structure and you know uh, staffing staffing titles. So I think that's all I have to add, and I'll punt to Chris. Yeah, thanks, Christina, and also thanks for drafting this. Um, yeah, I mean, in the big picture, obviously, I think uh, we've, in, in general, we have, you know, old old stuff that needs to be, be disposed of every year, you know, filing cabinets, fax machines, all kinds of things like that. Um, and we typically try to auction it off before we get rid of it. You know, our this, this ordinance has been in effect for a long time, but it's been you know, sort of dysfunctional for quite a long time, too, because the, the uh, staff that are referenced, you know, our old staff positions that haven't existed for quite a while, et cetera, so we're, a big part of it is just modernizing. But the other, you know, big issue that prompts it is uh, the potential uh, that we may want to sell some of our parcels, especially some of the parcels that we have in San Juan County, for the purposes of helping to finance uh, potentially new office space and, you know, also potentially affordable housing projects in Grand County. And uh, so this ordinance is required by state law if we're going to go through a process like that. And so this is in anticipation of putting together a potential public hearing uh, for uh, the potential sale of property that Grand County owns. And so. Uh, that's, that's the main impetus for this. One thing to um, focus the commission on is the definition section. Um, we are obligated by statute to define reasonable notice and what a significant parcel of real property means. So those definitions are there for your consideration. Um, fair market value, that's not an obligation um, to define, but a good idea. That it, the definition you see here is actually from our old um, ordinance, uh, but I thought it was a good one. So I left that as is. I update the reasonable notice to be consistent with the notice we require in the land use code, um, basically, and it's consistent with state code, uh, sort of basic noticing requirements for state code. Um, and then the significant parcel of real property that is certainly up for discussion, um, it was set really, really low in our 2005 ordinance, which of course is out of touch now with our market. Um, and after studying many different counties and how they do this, um, I opted for, um, you know, a, a definition that includes both a size parameter and a value parameter. And we can use either one as we wish. Um, but those are, that's, that's up for discussion. Yeah, that was the only thing that I was slightly like, oh, I don't know. But if you if you researched it and you thought that that was fairly standard, then I'm OK with it. I, yeah, that was the only part that I was a little like, uh, should it be one acre and 100 grand? I don't know. But you you would pro you if mm -hmm. you know, if you looked at these, you'd have a much better understanding of that. So, so is it is it either or? Um... A uh, quarter of a million dollars or, or yeah so we can choose either one um so if it's a it's a piece of property say that's a acre that's worth five million yeah then that's a definite significant parcel of real property right. chris can opine i don't think we own any property with a fair market value of less than 250 so I think the way we've defined this captures every single piece of real property owned by Grand County as a significant parcel of real property. Um, there yeah. was at, at least um, one rural county I looked at with a value set at 100,000, Trish, and I did think about it, but I just, I don't think we need to go there. Well, yeah, I mean, the five acres sounds like maybe too much, but as uh, Christina indicates, I don't think that any of our parcels are worth less than two hundred and fifty thousand, and so, you know, it's every every bit of property that we own is going to be considered a significant parcel of real property according to this definition. If we use the dollar value, um, <clears throat> you know, obviously five acres could be quite a lot, um, but I suppose if it's five acres, you know, in um, some location that uh, has no water utilities or development potential then you know it could be worth quite a bit less than 250,000 maybe um but you know i would try to rely more on the market value than the 
parcel size, maybe. Um, but like I say, as it's drafted right now, all of our real estate is going to be considered a significant parcel of real property. The size is not required to include. So, I mean, someone could motion either to drop that size requirement down or to even eliminate that subsection A. So, you know, that's up for discussion for you guys. I'm okay if it's an either or situation. I think it's fine. I think for me, the, the, I don't want to, with the fair market value and saying that, um, uh, I don't want to bind our hands to that if we find a, a beneficial use that, um, uh, or if there's the ability to donate. I'm, I'm thinking if, if we wanted to build a hospital or give it to the school dresser or give it to the housing authority, we, you know, that we might see a need in our community that's lacking because of market value of property. And we might try to partner and help with something like that. Does that make sense? No, but that definition doesn't define the consideration that we receive. That definition defines how we surplus it. Right, but uh, so under real property in B, it says the county commission shall not dispose of significant parcel of real property for less than farm fair market value which may be paid by monetary or non-monetary consideration. So if we value a public use like workforce housing or a, a hospital or whatever, um, you know, that partnership could be valued. So I think there's a little okay. more to this. Um, you know, I think that it, it kind of depends on, on who we would be selling to. Um, there's another statute that I probably should have dug up for, for the purposes of this discussion. You know, if we are selling to the private sector and it's not a nonprofit, you know, it's not a charitable or religious organization, then I think that we are actually required by law to be compensated fair market value. And I don't know that, you know, that we have a lot of option that way. But there's another component of statute, and again, I can't remember it off the top of my head. It's been a few years since I read it. But, you know, we do have the capacity to make donations to charitable and religious organizations. Um, and, and we're not bound to that fair market value um, component. Yeah. As long and as so, we're not painting ourselves in a corner here. And so, you know, I think that, you know, understanding that nonprofits, you know, are a little bit of a different scenario than, than dealing with uh, uh, private sector companies that are for profit or or, you know, even our nonprofits that are not charitable religious organizations. And so, you know, I, I'll try to dig that up, you know, later and um, present it next time also. I don't think it has any bearing on this ordinance, but it's useful to know anyway. Right, because it still requires we sell for fair market value. I'll also say that I, I looked at four, maybe five other county ordinances and none of them make any distinguishment, you know, for a for-profit versus a nonprofit. Um, well, yeah, and I, it, you know, it, the state law changes all the time. The last time that we were discussing um, potentially changing the use of the motor cross track in uh, San Juan County, you know, we did dig up the ordinances. There was a nonprofit uh, or there a proposed nonprofit use for that property. And so we went through the process of evaluating, you know, how we would potentially donate it or lease it, you know, for less than fair market value. And there is a process for it, you know, and it's, there is actually a process to donate to for-profit entities too, but you have to go through this extended process to, to prove up why the donation to the, to the uh, for-profit entity provides a public benefit, but it's an extended process. Um, so it's all possible, but, you know, when, when we, Surplus property, there is, and this indicates that, you know, there's no obligation to actually sell or accept any offers. But if we do want to sell, then we, then we have to comply with our ordinance, you know, which requires a public hearing. And so, you know, with regard to discussing the definition for significant parcel of real property, the only real difference between a significant parcel of real property and one that's of, you know, I guess you might consider insignificant, um, is one requires a public hearing and the other doesn't, but both of them have to be approved in a public meeting by the county commission. Right, Christina? Correct. 
So we're talking about a difference between a public hearing for for anything over 250,000 or over five acres, or just you know a vote of the commission in a public meeting otherwise. And the consideration and I mean, paid must be released during the public meeting. So all that's public information. Yeah. Great, any other commissioners have a comment or question or does someone want to make a motion? I would move to repeal and re replace Grand County Ordinance 413 from 2005, adopting new section 1.05 of the Grand County General Ordinances to establish the manner in which the real and personal property may be disposed of, acquired and managed. Thanks, Evan. Do I have a second? Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Clapper, uh, second by Commissioner Stock. I'll call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Vote passes unanimously. Move on to item R, that's a, approving the chair's signature on a data request to the Utah State Tax Commission. That's my item. Um, so this is a group, this is Jay Powell. He, he works at the Southeastern Utah Association of Local Governments. And as described here in the summary, um, they've historically worked with Carbon and Emory to, do, to complete a retail sales leakage report. Um, and that the report is created by Zions Public uh, Finance and they do a presentation on the findings when that, when that data comes through. And I did, I did do a little uh, sort of following up with Jade in terms of, you know, because on our, um, on the application, it does say, um, you know, the information will be used in county economic development and recruitment efforts. Um, and importantly for the public and everyone to be aware that that data is kept confidential, of course, and no information to be disclosed for groups of less than 10 businesses. Um, but you know, that made me think that that first sentence in county economic development and recruitment efforts, it doesn't necessarily sound like um, it's the type of information that we, you know, it, it, would we be free to use that information in a way that would be useful to, in any way useful to the county, not necessarily in just uh, development and recruitment. Um, because what, I, what I've learned is that sales tax leakage in this in this sense that it's being used in this sense is actually more about where we could be gener how we could be generating more like what opportunities there are to generate more sales tax in our county that are being where where people are taking their dollars outside of the county and and how we could be sort of capturing those dollars um, rather than and potential fraud and things of that nature um, though when I followed up with Jade and sort of got that clarification, um, you, you know, his, his, wor his words are the tax information will just be for ana analysis purposes and where sales tax is leaking out of your county. This is the intent, um, not really looking into what businesses are paying if, and if they are paying the appropriate amount of sales tax. However, if the data could be used to analyze if a business is paying the appropriate amount of sales tax. I don't see why you couldn't use it for that purpose. Ultimately, Grand County will own the data since it's from your county and you can use it for whatever you'd like. Um, so I just wanted to give that extra follow-up to this in the sense that um, you know, we'll get a certain analysis from Zions Financial, um, but ultimately if there is other useful data to mine out of it, um, that, that, will, that would be available. Um, I don't know how many other questions I can really answer on the on the matter, um, but is it, are there any questions or comments? I'd uh, make a motion, Gabe. Great, please. Uh, I move to approve the chair's signature on a sales tax data request form to be sent to the Utah State Tax Commission. Great, do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. All right, uh, I have a, uh, uh, is there any discussion? No, motion by Commissioner Hadler, second by Commissioner Walker, a call for a vote, all those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. All right, vote passes unanimously. Thank you all. And then uh, 
We have item S, approving letter to San Juan County Planning Commission regarding concerns about the proposed campground in Mill Creek Canyon. Um, and I have Commissioner Stock up for that, this one. Um, I guess I can just say that I highlighted basically two main concerns with the campground proposal, um, fire danger and water quality issues that I felt were um, important for Grand County to weigh in on. Um, the letters there. Do people have questions? Or uh, does anyone else want to point out anything you're saying? Does anyone know how this sort of, did this item come up or was it discussed in the San Juan County Planning Commission already or? It was, um, my understanding, it was on a planning commission meeting and it was tabled. That's all I know about it, so. Yeah, er, earlier we, we sent a letter at, asking them to table it. You know, m many people made that same comment and they discussed it for quite a while and ended up tabling it, so. Okay. I would understand a motion. If there aren't any other questions or comments. Um, I'll I would be, go ahead, Kevin. No, after you. I would make a motion to approve a letter to San Juan County Planning Commission um, pertaining to the campground in Mill Creek. Is that good enough? I don't have my cheat sheet. That, that, that'll do. Do I have a second? <laughs> I'll, I'll second. Mm -hmm. All right, any further discussion? All right, that was a motion on the floor by Commissioner Hadeen, second by Commissioner Walker. Um, all those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Trish, was that a was that an aye? All right, vote passes unanimously. All right, moving on to the consent agenda. Um, item T, ratifying chair's signature on a letter to San Juan County Administrative Law Judge. Lynn Lloyd Creswell concerning the proposed Sky Ranch Airport. Um, item U, termination of citizen board appointment. Um, item V, approving a letter to US Congressman John Curtis regarding the public lands proposal process. I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a second? Second. All right, any, any discussion? All right, so we had a motion on the floor by Commissioner Walker, second by Commissioner Hadler. Um, and I'll call for a vote. All those voting in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Aye. Thank you. Vote passes unanimously. All right. Um, Chris, do you have anything to add to the calendar special events section? Uh, no, but. Does anybody have any corrections or anything that, that I need to be aware of to, to adjust on the calendar? I do not, anyone? Yeah, let's see. So <clears throat> trying to emulate what uh, Mallory would do. Um, so the option Arches Ultra uh, was uh, prior weekend. Um, then we've got um, February 19th, uh, MM Red Hot Ultra, a variety of different uh, events. You know, I'm not, to tell you the truth, I'm not uh, up to snuff with reading uh, Mallory's spreadsheets. <laughs> but That's if anybody, right. If anybody <laughs> has yeah. any corrections, um, you know, I can certainly note those and pass them along to Mallory so that we can make any corrections to the calendar. Appreciate the effort, Chris. Are there, is there anyone seeking clarification on the calendar? All right. Thank you so much. Um, let's move right along here to public hearings. And we'll start with item X, 
and that's the annual public hearing on county mental health and substance use disorder needs. Melissa, I feel like last we're always keeping you until bedtime for this public hearing. One of I these years, we're going to get to you a little earlier. I did <laughs> almost so fall much. asleep. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good to hear all the going ons in in, Car in Grand County. So there you go. Good. Yeah. <laughs> So um, every year we come to the commit, we come to a commission meeting. Usually it's a bit the beginning of the calendar year. Um, and we go to the meetings in all of our catchment areas uh, that Four Corners provides substance use disorder treatment and mental health treatment. The counties that we serve are Grand County, Carbon County and Emory counties. The purpose of us being here today is uh, to open up an opportunity for community members to make comments or feedback about anything they wanna share publicly during this meeting. Um, and so in addition, this public meeting also presenting this every year is a requirement of our Medicaid contract so that enrollees uh, in the Medicaid program have an opportunity to, to speak about services in addition to our interlocal agreement that we have with the three counties, uh, Grand, Emory, and Carbon. So I will be attending all of the commission meetings in uh, each of those three counties to basically get public comment from everyone. And I had originally planned to um, kind of give you a little, a little bit of background on what we do. If, and so, but for time's sake, <laughs> rather than me giving a big spiel on something, um, I would say I'm open to any comments and I'm also open to any questions. So if you guys wanna hear more about anything, just let me know. Is that okay <laughs> that we do it that way? <laughs> okay. That's great, yep. Are there any questions or comments from anyone present here tonight? No, I, I uh, appreciate what you guys are doing. And, and I know when we do it this in person, it's always nice to hear from members of the community that have been served by Four Corners. And um, uh, appreciate what you're doing and am excited to partner together in the future. Yep, me too. Thank you. Yeah, it is, it is a little bit difficult in this virtual option to um, get people to come out and, you know, people who have maybe even had a positive experience with us to come and share with the commissioners, you know, what their experience has been with us, but we do a lot of things and Gabriel sits on our board. As you know, we have a, a county commissioner from each area. And so he can tell you there's a lot of moving parts in our system <laughs> and we do a lot of stuff, everything from crisis to inpatient placement and everything in between. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of moving parts, but I'm always happy to answer anyone's questions, anytime public community members, commissioners, anyone. So you can definitely just call me at our location and I'm happy to talk. Yep. These folks are one of the many heroes in our community and <laughs> we're so, we're so excited for the new facility here in Moab. Yes, that's coming. It's coming. We should be. Uh, our initial completion is in April and our potential move-in date is in May. So pretty soon. We're very excited. Yeah. Any other comments at this time? Not seeing any. So I'll go ahead. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to get this right. I'll go ahead and open this public hearing and we will accept um, we will accept written comments. Um, I'll open this public hearing at 8.08 p.m. on February 1st. We will accept comments um, until 5 p.m. on on February 9th. Boy, did I butcher that. Is that, is that good? I, this, this is a detail that I don't have quite ready. But Chris, is that, is that, was that passable? Uh, almost. <laughs> so first <laughs> off, I would just solicit public comments and then give some right. time for them. And, and then- I guess I, uh, I, I didn't do that specifically. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and, so, and then after uh, that's over, then uh, you can state that you're gonna leave the uh, public hearing open until um, 5 p.m. Wednesday the 9th, assuming that works for uh, Four Corners. 
I don't know. If, do you need to have um, something signed before Wednesday the 9th? No, not not signed before then, no. Um, okay. I, I am a little unfamiliar with that process, so I apologize in my ignorance, but what does that mean for me that it's open until the 9th? Anything? Just well, nothing probably. I mean, it's just our policy uh, that we keep public hearing, hearings open for written comment. It's not okay. statutorily re required. Um, and so it's not required for your public hearing. It's just oh, okay. a part of a practice that we engage in that, you know, that just gives uh, citizens more opportunity for comment. Um, okay. Also, we have a policy typically of not taking action on a public hearing until the um, meeting after the public hearing, you know, again, to give the commissioners uh, time to absorb the input, that kind of thing. So in this case, you know, we're just fulfilling a statutory obligation that you have a public hearing. Yeah. And, so, you know, um, it's not strictly necessary in this case. I don't think that we leave it open until the ninth, but that's what we do, and I don't see that it would cause any harm. So, Gabe, I would just okay. go ahead, open it up to public comments, and if we receive any, then take them, and then after that's over, um, leave it open for public comment until 5 p.m. Wednesday the 9th. Thanks, Chris. All right, I think I'll get it next time. All right, so I will open up this public hearing at this time. Are, are there any members of the public that would like to present comment right now during this meeting? All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I will leave this um, public hearing open until 5 p.m. on Tuesday, um, on February 9th. Um, and yeah, I think that that's. Thank you very much, Melissa, for being here and for waiting with us. <laughs> Take care. No, now. no problem, um, Gabriel. I I only need one signature, um, so I'll just email that to you. So on on this particular thing, we only need one signature. So. Okay, great. All right. I might have to route it through my office to get an e signature to e to e sign. So if you could actually send it to the to the commission or well, do you have if you have Tara or I mean if you have Mallory's uh, email? I, I think can, so. Uh, I, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can we can get it to the commission office and um, we will. Uh, yeah, and then you can sign it and get it back to us. Like I said, you're you're the first um, public hearing we've had. Our Emory County one is not until the 15th, so we have some time. Great. So. Thanks again for all you do. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> all right. All right, moving on to item Y. This is a public hearing to consider an ordinance approving the overnight accommodations overlay campground for parcel number 24-0XST-0067 located off State Road 313. Planning and zoning staff. Thank you, Chairman Wojtek. And I will yeah, try- Thank to... you, thank you as well for being here so late. <laughs> oh, no, no problem. Um, I'll try to move through this really quick. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen just so I can show you the concept plan for this. And I'll try to kind of move through it as I uh, present the staff report. Um, so, yeah, this is the Entrada Moab uh, OAO proposal for um, campground, campground district to be applied to a 544-acre parcel out on um, highway, uh, sorry, State Road 313 at the intersection of 191 uh, for the purpose of developing a luxury eco retreat centered on environmentally responsible tourism. The OAO proposal includes plans for 16 tent sites, activity center, spa and swimming pools, uh, panoramic deck and trails. The future site plan not being considered as part of the OAO application proposes six employee units. Um, the property is zoned range and grazing and is currently undeveloped and surrounded by BLM land, which is predominantly used for recreation. The uh, applicant will be required to provide a public water source at site plan review. Wastewater uh, will be treated using an Orenco on-site treatment unit and drain field. Preliminary engineering studies will be required to access the uh, to assess the feasibility of a public water source and ability to dispose of wastewater on site. And UDOT will, um, will need to be, uh, we'll, need, we'll need to actually get a, a required, um, sorry, a permit 
from UDOT for access off of State Road 313. Also, a drainage study will be required specifically to address the crossing of smile, uh, Seven Mile Wash, a major drainage channel. And due to the site being adjacent to steep high slopes and cliffs, um, a stability and rockfall hazard study will be required by a licensed geotechnical engineer. So all those things will be addressed at the site plan review stage. Um, so in terms of the general plan, I'll just quickly state that the type of land use that this development proposes is consistent with the North Corridor future land use designation um, as it fits in with nodes of tourism and resort commercial development. However, the project site is also within the Scenic Resource Protection District, which was adopted after the general uh, plan future future land use map and therefore takes precedence. So um, there's a view of the proposed tent sites and kind of the reason we were gonna be requesting a geotechnical study um, in terms of the rocks and the, and the geology around there. Um, I will briefly touch on what the Scenic Resource Protection District um, purposes. A couple of those uh, uh, purposes are intended to accomplish prioritizing the preservation of the natural beauty and ecological quality of the gateway to Moab and facilitate the use and enjoyment of the area while providing opportunities for development that enhances the character of the area while not impeding its scenic value. Um, another one that would apply to this um, project is recognizing this area as a gateway to the valuable scenic, scenic amenities of the greater Moab area and as, and as an introduction to the character and outdoor ethics of the community. The Entrada Moab tent sites and resort amenities have been planned so that they are not visible from Highway 191 and SR 313. The majority of the land will be left undeveloped um, preserving the scenic resource of the seven mile area. Um, the applicant will develop the site in accordance with the SRPD design standards to protect the scenic byways of Highway 191 and 313. The preferred zone district for parcels within SRPD with access adjoining US 191 and 313 is actually resort special, but this, as I stated earlier, is um, zoned range and grazing, so that's just something to note. Um, let's see. And I'm just gonna kind of skip through to touch on some of the more pertinent topics. Um, Entrada Moab is um, consistent with 4.6.1 OAO district's um, purpose insofar as being located in an area where camping and recreation are the historic and primary activities. The development would be compatible with adjacent land uses, um, being recreation and camping. The site is accessed by a main arterial. Um, the Entrada Moab would offset its impact on infrastructure by generating renewable energy for at least 80% of energy demand on site and sewer will be managed on site as well so as to have no impact on existing Grand County sewer infrastructure. The proposal includes plans to utilize gray water recycling and stormwater infiltration um, while the proposed development does, does offer a variety of amenities on site, it does not propose mixed uses on site or elsewhere in the community, except for the addition of employee housing in the future site plan. Um, as far as transportation, uh, there is no transit or shuttle stop delineated um, on the site plan as there is no public transit to the site uh, currently. The subject property is located within the North Moab Recreation Corridor identified by the non-motorized trails master plan. And as such, any trails identified in this plan that run through the property will be dedicated to the public in an easement. Uh, the development is set far back from the fronting road and largely hidden from view. Tent sites and common buildings will be oriented to pro provide views of open space. Parking area will be primitive and solar panels and other equipment will be hidden from view. Um, so uh, this is the last little bit of important information um, considering considerations for approval, denial, and postponement. 
Um, we have to look at the overnight ratio, overnight accommodations ratio to um, long-term prim, uh, primary, primary residential units, which currently is 1.7 in the county. Um, the ratio is uh, three points above the early 2019 ratio of 1.4, which is considered the baseline for approving new OAO districts. Um, Um, possible community benefits of Entrada Moab may be responsible, organized small scale camping with minimal impact on county public infrastructure. The most impact the project will likely have is the demand for emergency services, additional demand for water and increased use of public lands. And the planning commission recommendation um, was to approve with conditions on October 11, 2021 at a public hearing, the public the Planning Commission unanimously approved a motion to send a favorable recommendation to the County Commission for the Entrada Moab OAO application with the condition that six deed restricted employee housing units included should be included in the master plan. Unfortunately, at this point, the, the land use code does not um, allow for uh, employee housing to be part of the proposal for OAO campgrounds. We're working on changing that. Um, therefore, we cannot legally include deed restricted employee housing as a condition of approval for this application, but the applicant is very dedicated to providing the employee housing. Um, let's see. I think that's all of the main points that I wanted to touch on in the staff report. Um, if there are any questions or any clarifying points. I had a question. I don't know if you've talked to the developer, but the the layout of the entire area is, is pretty broad. Like it's almost a mile from one end to the other. Are they expecting guests to just walk or um, is that like a roadway? Are they going to have UTVs people drive or do you know? I don't know the the answer to your question, Sarah. Um, the applicant, I think, is here. Um, I, so I can might... answer that if you'd like. OK. Uh yeah, and I am here, and uh, this is Matt Carius. I'm the applicant, and, and this is uh, Paul Berg. He was our engineer. Just go ahead, Matt. You're welcome to answer it. Okay. Um, so the um, the development, as you can see, is a, is a fairly small um, area overall with um, compared to the 544 acres. The, um, the distance from Highway 313 to the back of the canyon, it, my understanding is about a mile. So our... Um, area with our tents, I believe is, is quite a bit less than that. And we're going to develop um, uh, walkways uh, between tents and the uh, main lodge, which um, is marked as number one on the, on the um, PDF that you're seeing right now. Um, so there'll be uh, mostly um, people walking between um, buildings, but we'll also provide mountain bikes for people and um, some motorized transport for people who are unable to walk or, or ride bikes. Thank you. This is a any other, uh, master plan. Any system. other further questions or clarifications that the commission had before I open the public hearing? May I say one thing? Yes, you may. Okay, uh, just before we open the public hearing, I just, um, another aspect of our, our application that was considered by the Planning Commission that we, we um, had to take out because I, uh, of the way the OAO code is written um, is that our intention is to preserve as much land as possible from development, from current development from future development. And um, we're intending to put a, a pretty significant conservation easement, at least on the front part of the property, um, with the goal of protecting the view shed along Highway 313. And um, as Elisa mentioned, um, we've designed this so that we, we don't affect the view shed. Um, and then the goal of the easement would be to pre prevent any other um, development going forward um, along, the, along the highway. Um, as Elisa mentioned in her excellent summary, the, the land is zoned 
range and grazing, which I'm sure all of you know, um, allows for some residential housing development and some um, commercial development. Um, and I, I, I happen to know because we've been under contract to buy this land for quite some time that there are definitely um, entities out there that would be quite interested in the opportunity to develop um, some, at least some residential um, units along the, the front part of the property. So um, I think in that, you know, in that, in light of that, the, uh, the easement is something I hope you'll um, consider. Thank you. All right, with that, um, it's 8.25 p.m. and I will open this public hearing. Um, I invite members of the public to um, unmute and, and speak now to contribute to this public hearing at this time. Chairman, this is Paul Berg. I'm the project engineer and planner. Just a few comments I'd like to share with you is from a technical standpoint, this is part of your north corridor and one of the uses that's involved with that. It's near other AOA campground uses or zones. It's compatible with adjacent land uses and it meets the conditions for an OAO as outlined in 4.6.2A of your code and also 4.6. 0.7C2G of your code. Maybe just a few other things about the project. They'll realize that there are only 16 tent sites for 544 acres. That's one tent per 34 acres. And we're only going to develop about 1% of the land. However, you know, with Glamping's popularity and with the type of with the type of facility that we're envisioning, the, the overnight the overnight rental for these 16 sites is, is about equal to 150 hotel units. So large income for the county, but low amount of visitors. So we hope that that's a, a benefit for, for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other members of the public that uh, wish to comment at this time? Um, I see John Weisheit. Uh, yeah, please hi. state your yeah. Please state your name and and thanks for coming for comments. Sure, uh, John Weisheit, resident of Grand County. So um, I would like to ask the applicant if they've had discussions with the National Park Service about uh, how it might how it might impair the groundwater that is necessary for the function of the ecosystem in, Grant, in uh, Arches National Park. Have you talked to the staff there yet or? Um, we have not specifically spoken to the National Park um, regarding that issue. We have been working with um, a, a hydrologist that's been involved in drilling a lot of the wells in the area um, um, recently and, and in years past. And he assures us that um, we, we won't run into conflict with the Arches Protection Zone um, and that um, if we're able to uh, drill a, a productive well on our property, that that it, that won't be an issue. Obviously, that is uh, something that we'll have to um, address at some point more directly with uh, with the Park Service. So then, another question I have is: Is there any areas of critical concern that the BLM needs to know about, as far as groundwater and? Not to my knowledge. Um, Paul, I don't know if you have any um, thoughts on that, but we've, that, that, that hasn't come up. Um, well, I would appreciate you calling the BLM about that and looking at their management plan to see if there's no conflict with uh, some of the ecosystems that are trying to be preserved here in Grand County. Um, have you also thought of perhaps doing some sort of monitoring well to measure the ground table water so that um, other communities will be, won't be affected by your withdrawals? Because, um, you know, not just Grand County, but the, Encar the entire Colorado River Basin is in a shortage situation right now. We're, we don't have 
any more water to spare, quite <laughs> frankly. So we have to think about these things. Um, we have to think about long-term resiliency and, and um, sustainability. And if you, so are there any plans to do some sort of, are you gonna monitor your, your well? I well, guess. absolutely we are. We're, we're developing a, a water management plan in conjunction with the, um, the hydrologist. Um, right now, at, at this stage, um, we're still pursuing our, um, different potential options for where water might come from. So um, if we're not as far along that process as it seems like we, we should be, that's why. But um, you can rest assured our, you know, our, our, our corporate mission is um, conservation, open space, preservation, and um, sustainability. And so we're, we follow uh, best practices in, in every case when it comes to um, water usage and, and things of that nature. Okay, well, it sounds like an annual report to the state engineer about groundwater uh, sustainability might be a good thing for a, a, your business practice. Absolutely. That's a John, John, yeah. if I, sorry, if I could just interrupt, sorry, I, I don't want to, th thanks for your input and this quality um, comments, um, but I, I just want to make sure this is a public hearing and I, I don't want to make this a sort of a, a Q and A with the developer. Um, so I really do want to hear, we, you know, we all want to hear your, your concerns um, addressed and, and here today and in writing further. Um, and, I, and, and perhaps the developer can address those kind of more comp comprehensively, perhaps um, at the following meeting. Uh, but now, you know, if you have any other sort of, um, you know, concerns or, or sort of um, comments to make at this time, sort of no. I'd ask you to sort of present them um, yeah. rather than as a question. No, Gabriel. I don't, and you're right. I probably extended my. It's okay. <laughs> Those are my concerns. You all know my ma major concern is about water. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak tonight? Um, I know um, that. Sorry. I know that we've gotten some comments um, in the commission email about um, cultural resources and trails in the area and that area being valued um, for its scenic stuff. And so I, I guess I was wondering, are there designated trails that would be protected by the, the provisions that you were talking about um, earlier, Lisa? I mean, we, you know, I was looking closely at the non-motorized um, trails master plan. And I was trying to see if there were any trails identified um, going across that property in that plan. And I didn't see anything specifically, but I know that plan is needing to be updated as well. Um, so I know that the applicant would be more than willing and is, and that's kind of their whole philosophy. They want to be, um, you know, providing the public benefit of, of keeping that, the majority of that land um, accessible and having trail easements is definitely part of that. Um, so, and I, and I think that would be, I mean, it is already required in the OAO section in the code. I mean, once you go to site plan review, we do have to provide those easements as part of the application review, so. I, I'm not sure if it's the, this is the exact location, but I have heard concerns about climbing access in this general area. So. May I address that, or is it that not the format here? Um, you. Uh, okay, you can go ahead and address that particular I'll be, I'll be very quick. item. The, the property is currently owned by in, Intrepid uh, Potash and there's been no public access for at least 30 years. Um, so there is, no, um, there is no loss of existing access. Um, if people are climbing in there, they, they were doing it against uh, Intrepid Potash's wishes. Um, so th yeah, there'll be no yeah. loss of that climbing or other, other uh, outdoor assets um, because of our, our project. 
Thank you for that clarification. Are there any other members of the public um, on the on the call tonight um, <clears throat> that wish to speak? Hi, yeah, this is Brian. I'd like to make a comment. Please, thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, this is, uh, my name is Brian Hayes and uh, my wife, Angela and I own a piece of property that is actually would be surrounded on three sides by this proposed development. Um, we're a neighboring landowner, so uh, we'd like to make a comment on that. Uh, overall, we support this project and for several reasons. Uh, the first one being that, as was mentioned, the current zoning range and grazing, you know, does allow for some degree of development, uh, could be residential homes. There's even some stuff in there like dog kennels and uh, machine shops. So under the current zoning, it could be, there could be a degree of development around our property um, that could end up being you know, like multiple second homes or other residents, residences around ours. Um, you know, we've talked to Matt. Um, we know that the intention on this is for them to put a conservation easement on the front part of the property that surrounds, surrounds our lot and is the closer lot to SR 313 and to keep that undeveloped. And so, you know, rather than having in the future potentially no, numerous second homes or other developments, uh, we think this is a good opportunity to protect this land as open space, protect the view shed. Um, we personally support it for personal reasons. It's, it's good for our property. Uh, it would enhance it to limit development around it. But I think it also provides a public uh, benefit of just preserving the land long term. I think this is a less impactful use than other you know, uses that are already permitted and would not require a zoning change within that zone. So um, we support the project as a neighboring landowner. And thanks for the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much for your comment. All right, this public hearing is still open. Anyone else uh, wish to speak at this time? Gabe, okay, I, I had, should I wait until there's no more members of the public for my questions or can I jump in now? Um, yeah, okay. I guess, yeah, I, I guess I was a little bit unclear in terms of this not necessarily being the time to sort of drill down on questions and more just kind of dedicated to the public hearing aspect. Um, so, but I, I suppose if we're here and, uh, I, you know, I, I guess I, I, I guess I'm, I, where, I, where I'm as I'm kind of preferring that that happen at the, at the next meeting, um, and this kind of be more dedicated to the public hearing. Is that acceptable to you? Um, well, I guess, I mean, certainly, you know, we should do a, the, the full public, he public hearing, but you know, sometimes I think it's better to ask questions and raise issues, you know, earlier rather than just before we vote, because it gives us time to do further research or think about it, so. Fair enough. Um, are there any other members of the public that, um, that are here to, to give comments right now? All right, I, I will allow you to uh, raise um, any questions you might have, Commissioner Walker. Um, yeah, so just, I think as 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 folks know, um, you know, expansion of overnight accommodations is is kind of a, a big and sensitive issue in this, this community because of just what's been happening over the past five years, and so we we have deliberately tried to make it pretty hard to um, develop a, um, additional overnight accommodations, especially while we're still building out the pipeline for things that got approved before 2019, um, and so. The, and you know, personally, I'm not inclined to pay for anything unless it's got some unusual features. And so, for example, a month or so ago, there was something that was pretty small and also very far from Spanish Valley, where all, all our concerns are. Um, this is in the Spanish Valley area, but you raised the point about the conservation e easement and the sort of you know contrast between the size of the parcel and the limited number of things you're putting in there. Um, so I guess I just wanted to invite you to say more about that. And, and I guess I'm especially interested in to what extent, you know, we can be assured that, um, you know, that the conservation easement really will happen, that it is only 16 units, you know, that, that you know, what's going to happen is this, is 
pretty close to what's being presented here because you know, a, a situation that often comes up is we one a county might approve a zone change and the developer says they want to do X, but the zone change actually allows a bunch of other things and something, you know, a new owner buys it and something completely different happens. So um, I think you understand. So yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I appreciate it. Um, well, first of all, let, let me say that um, I completely understand the um, community's reaction to any sort of new overnight accommodation proposal. I was born in Fruta in 1970 and was born and raised there, so I've been coming to Moab for decades, and I've seen firsthand what's uh, what's happened there and how tourism has impacted the community. Um, I started this project five years ago, um, looking around long before the new um, OAO uh, code was put in place. Unfortunately, I couldn't get my, my ducks in a row uh, before it happened. Um, so I, you know, I get, even though we're, we're 16 tenths, we're small, we're, as Paul pointed out, you know, we're, our, our contribution to the tax base would be similar to 150 or 200 room hotel, but we're, we're not, hopefully not um, exacerbating many of the problems associated with tourism, and we're certainly not increasing the uh, visitor capacity by much. Um, in terms of um, how, how we can guarantee that what we say uh, we're going to do, that we actually do it, um, I'm, I'm open to what um, the county needs and the commission needs uh, to feel comfortable with this. Um, we were asked to take the, we had the easement as part of our uh, original application that was considered by the planning commission. And apparently that wasn't really, uh, um, and maybe Elisa could probably elaborate more on the, on the specifics of why we had to take it out, but um, they did, we weren't allowed to, to, they weren't allowed to base their approval upon the condition of the easement. But, um, you know, I've made a personal commitment to Brian and Angela Hayes, and um, I, I'll, you know, I'll make a commitment in writing if that, it's what it takes that will, um, you know, we, we have no intention of developing the, the front end of the property. And if, and if we can make people feel better about this by ensuring that it never gets developed, you know, that's what we'd like to do. Um, I'm just not sure what the appropriate mechanism is for that at this stage of where we're at, but um, I'm, I'm open. So okay. some things that we offered at the planning commission meeting though, was that we could enter into a development agreement or even a, a similar agreement with the AOA application. I don't know if there's such thing as a zone change agreement, but a, but a type of development agreement with the AOA application that locks us into the master plan that we presented to you, which is only the 16 sites plus the conservation easement. Um, I've done well, that let me, in other communities. Right, let me clarify just really quickly because we do have a development agreement that goes along with this application for the OAO district. And it does um, specifically limit you to what you're proposing in terms of your units. So it would say 16 units max, um, and that can never change. But um, we cannot include the other items like the employee housing and the um, conservation easement in the development agreement. Uh, I know that would be so nice, but it's just the way that the, the code was written for this OAO districts it's not, we don't require those things out in the OAO um, specifically for campgrounds. So we, because we didn't clearly like outright ask for those things in the code, uh, you as the developer cannot offer those things. It would be like, it's just legally not possible. So mm. yeah, it's what, kind of where we're at right now. We're trying to fix that in, in our next round of land use code updates and it would be possible to apply the overlay to only a portion of the property correct uh <laughs> that's been a conversation we've tried uh, we've had in the past where I, I think that where it's landed recently is that it no it actually it applies to the entire parcel but the development agreement um is very specific in terms of like it ties the that district to comply with the master plan as it's laid out. So, so specifically where the tent sites are located, um, roughly, you know, within reason. If they had to be moved for safety reasons or something, that would probably be fine. But um, they couldn't. A developer could not go out of uh, 
completely redesign their project after this was approved. It, they have to stick with the master plan layout and the units. And so that's basically, you know, that it, it looks like it's a big deal when the 544 parcel is has an overlay for OAO, but because it's bound to that development agreement, it limits the units, so. Yeah, and I think because of the master plan, it's actually to our advantage to have the mass, the restrictions in the master plan cover you know, more of the parcel rather than less. Right. Um, okay, well, that thanks. That, that answers my question. And I understand that some of the issues are maybe more questions for the planning department, not the, the developers. Yeah, and maybe a clarification on some of that would be, we can offer it, you just can't accept it, but maybe we can work together in the future to find a way to just make it work. Okay, Thank yeah, I understand, thanks. Gabe, are you hey, trying to talk? Are you, I, I think you're- Any other that. members of the, sorry about that, any other members of the public that would like to speak at this time, you still have a chance? All right, well, um, this public hearing will remain open um, until uh, 5 p.m. on February 2nd. And uh, February 9th, sorry, February 9th, did I say February 2nd? Yeah, it's getting late. Uh, this, this public hearing will remain open until 5 p.m. on February 9th. All right, um, we'll move on to item Z. Um, and that's a public hearing to hear public comment regarding an amended development agreement for an extended deadline for final plat for the Viewgate Terrace High Density Housing Overlay Zone. Elisa. Thank you. Okay, so the Viewgate Terrace HTHO, you'll probably know this, but I just wanna make note, it's the site that's located off Highway 191, um, just behind the Wingate Hotel. So the Wingate was actually their phase one development and now they're in process for phase two, but they did um, the, uh, the expiration for their phase two final plot has uh, expired, has passed. So that was um, October 15, 2021. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me just find my place here. I'll just give you a quick a synopsis of the background approval. The preliminary plat was approved by planning commission on um, in 2020 and subsequently commission approved the final plat for phase one in July of 21, 2020. Um, and then the, of course, the original HGHO district for Viewgate Terrace was approved back in 2019. Um, and <clears throat> the applicant has formally requested a six month extension um, for phase two final plat for the development. Um, and the given the unforeseen and intricate issues, the reasons given were for the unforeseen and intricate issues related to subsurface water on certain lots and the need to establish appropriate mitigation for the water requiring considerable time and effort in both engineering and legal and county staffing transitions and shortages since the county approved the HGHO development. Um, the development agreement is also amended to clarify Article 4.7 of the Land Use Code to allow for the local businesses and nonprofits to hold title to the HGHO units if they qualify um, under 4.7 Land Use Code for HGHO. There are no site improvements to be made as a result of this amendment, and the Planning Commission uh, voted unanimously to send a favorable recommendation on January 10th, 2022 um, for approval of the Viewgate Terrace Amended Development Agreement. And this is again, this is exactly like the development agreement that we had to approve for Murphy Flats just a little while ago. Are there any questions? Any questions from anyone for Elisa before I open the public hearing? I, I think she answered all my questions with, with her summary, so good job. Great. I will go ahead and um, 
open up this public hearing to consider the ordinance approving the amended and restated development agreement for Fugate Terrace Phase Two Final Plat and HDA Show Development. It's 8:49 p.m. Are there any other are there any are there any members of the public that wish to speak at this time? All right. Um, I will leave this. Uh, we will leave this public hearing open until 5 p.m. on February 9th. And that's that does it for item Z. I would entertain a motion to um, enter closed se session. I'll make a motion to go into closed session. For what reason, Trish? I. <laughs> I believe we're discussing. Um, is it for the purchase exchange? Is it for the purchase exchange lease or sale of real property? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Do yes. I have a second? Thank you. <laughs> All right. We have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Hadeen, second by Commissioner Walker, to enter closed session. Um, all those in favor of entering closed session, raise your hand or say aye. 